the meeting to order. Would you please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. May I please have a roll call? Commissioner Harper Patterson. Present. Commissioner Marsters. Present. Commissioner Silberman. Present. Vice Chair Bergman. Present. <clears throat> Chair Gutierrez. Present. Public comment. Public comment is limited to items not on the agenda. The commission may briefly respond to statements made or questions posed as allowed by the Brown Act. However, the commission's general policy is to refer items to staff for attention or have a matter placed on the future commission's agenda for a more comprehensive action or report. Is there anyone here to speak on an item that's not on the agenda today? Okay, moving along. Approval of minutes. Did everybody get a chance to read the minutes? Any modifications? I don't have any changes. Uh, none for me. Although, can we take the uh, two sets of minutes in Can separate votes? Uh, yeah. Does somebody want to make a motion? I move that we approve the January 19th, 2016 minutes. Second. Can I get a roll call vote? Commissioner Harper Patterson? Yes. Commissioner Marsters? Yes. Commissioner Silverman? Abstain. Vice Chair Bergman? Yes. And Chair Gutierrez? Yes. Move approval of the February 1st, 2016 meeting minutes. Second. Roll call vote, please. Commissioner Harper Patterson? Yes. Commissioner Marsters? Yes. Commissioner Silverman? Yes. Vice Chair Bergman? Yes. And Chair Gutierrez? Yes. Public hearing. Procedure for public hearing. Staff will present a report on the history, physical features, et cetera, on the application, followed with the staff's recommendation. The applicant will make a presentation. Thereafter, interested members of the community may speak on the proposal. When all interested parties have had an opportunity to be heard, the hearing will be closed and no further discussion from the floor can be held. The commission will then consider the evidence and make its recommendation. If you challenge a public hearing item in court, you may be limited to raising only those issues you or someone else raised at the public hearing described in this notice, the public notice, or in a written correspondence delivered to the city at or prior to the public hearing. Speakers should fill out a speaker form found by the door and hand it to the recording secretary prior to addressing the commission. The speaker should come up to the microphone to speak since the meeting is being recorded. This will assist staff in preparing, minute, preparing the minutes. Um, item A, 1189 Laurel Street, APN 051344470, consideration of a request for a conditional use permit to operate a jazz lounge. And I am going to recuse myself from this item, um, being that uh, I fall within the 500 feet uh, from my personal residence. So I will hand it over to Shannon. Okay, thank you. All right, did we have a presentation from staff? Yes, we do. Thank Good you. evening, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Jill Lewis, and I will present to you the request for a conditional use permit to operate a jazz lounge at 1189 Laurel Street. The zoning of the property is MUSB Mixed Use South Boulevard. The general plan land use designation is neighborhood retail and mixed use medium density. This is an existing 1,500 square foot space with uh, an existing 360 square foot patio. The previous tenant was Clooney's and the current tenant is Savannah Jazz. The proposal is to have an acoustic jazz lounge at the rear of the structure, occupying the space that was previously dedicated to the pool table, jukeboxes, and music stage at Clooney's. Live entertainment was not a part of Clooney's original zoning ordinance, uh, zoning clearance, excuse me, back in 1974. Staff determined that the addition of live entertainment would require a conditional use permit application. At Savannah Jazz, the bar portion of the space is open from 10 a.m. to 2 a.m. daily. The current proposal involves adding acoustic jazz music to the bar use on weekdays from 5 p.m. to 11 p.m. and from 5 p.m. to midnight on the weekends and holidays. There's no difference uh, in parking required for the proposed addition of the jazz lounge since bar, nightclub, and lounge are combined into one category. None of the reviewing departments had any conditions of approval to add. Staff received one phone call from the son of a neighboring property owner inquiring about the proposal. 
These are the required findings that need to be made to approve the proposal. There are specific general plan policies that encourage supporting independent local businesses that serve city residents and visitors, encourage supporting the arts, and encourage the development of cultural amenities. This is the motion should you, should you choose to approve the item. I'm available for any questions you have for staff and the applicant is also present should you have any questions for him. Any questions for staff? I do. Um, I'm curious if if noise does become a concern later on, how would um, how would surrounding businesses or residents go about addressing that? So the business would be uh, expected to comply with the city's noise ordinance. Um, uh, somebody from the city would probably go out to measure noise levels, um, or they would retain their own um, acoustic consultant. Uh, I do have another question. So. If the music style changed, would it trigger a CUP review? It could. I believe condition number one has um, the ability to uh, return to planning commission for re-review um, should the music style change. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions for staff? So under the existing noise ordinance, isn't there a, a time of like 10 p.m. when the noise level goes down significantly. And so um, both of these times seem to be till 11 or midnight. That's where I see the issue, if there is going to be an issue with noise. So from staff's point of view, you have the flexibility to either work with um, the business owner or the ability to say, you know, if you can't take care of it, we'll shorten the hours? That's correct. Okay. And the other question I had is, it says acoustic, that means no amplifiers? Correct. Okay. And not on the patio? So not on the patio. It's within, all within the structure. All within inside the structure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions for staff? No? Okay. Thank you. Um, does the applicant ha want to make a presentation or have anything to say? I'm Dr. Pascal Boca, Chairman. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present this project. We uh, were in San Francisco for 12 years. We live in Emerald Hills. Uh, Vicky and I, and we thought that uh, the peninsula really needed uh, a little musical spark. Um, I, uh, I teach jazz at the University of San Francisco. Uh, I am a good neighbor. <laughs> it's important for me. No, it's uh, it's important for me that uh, the that the community supports this. The um, we have a certain number of. Uh, friends in the community, in the area, who are also supportive of this event, of what we're trying to accomplish, and uh, we hope that San Carlos and your board will be also receptive and supportive to what we do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions for applicant? Have any. All right, thank you very much. Okay, next um, I'd like to open it up uh, to public comment. I have two speaker cards right now. Um, if there's anyone else that wants to speak that hasn't filled out a speaker card, go ahead and do, you can do that right now. Uh, the first person is, uh, was it Greshaw the Q? I'm sorry if I, if I butchered that, so. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Um, I have the building as I own by, uh, excuse me? She was looking. Oh, okay. Um, I'm the son of the owner of the building next door, 1191-93, with a laundromat and the unit above. And some of these questions have been answered based on the individual base. If the music changes, that's a concern, because the bar does have has a turnover. I love jazz, so I don't have, say, considered the acoustic, everything sounds great, but sometimes whether there's soundproofing in the building has it been approved since the last time when they try to play music. I mean, I used to always have to call the police to stop them to play music. I've lost tenants based on, on the decibel of the music. Because being cinder block, the vibration goes from one building to the other. So that's the concern. Like you also said, the patio outside, it vibrates from the walls there too because it has a, an echoing sound sensation. 
And there's a lot of, you know, it's a residential, it is commercial, and I encourage the business um, that the gentleman's putting in here actually, to me, is a positive thing compared to what we've had since we've been in the building since 73. And, and, it's, and it's, it looks like finally it's the first step of a, a, a good step. And I, I don't see any, say, malice or any ma bad intention this gentleman has here. I think he's going to bring a great service to San Carlos. And probably after this, I'll talk to him, and we can work out if there's any situation with the noise or the neighborhood. Because we, you know, we, it's a small little community, San Carlos, and we wanted to prove in that one area. We always called a um, long time ago that area of Laurel Street the tenderloin of Laurel Street. <laughs> Because we always never got anything on that end of it. Every time by the time the Planning Commission had grand ideas, by the time we got past Britain, they ran out of money. So I would like to see the area improve and, and build up to, like, the, you know, the Knob Hill of Laurel Street. So um, <laughs> um, take that into consideration. The thing is just the turnover of the business. In case something happens and all of a sudden I get, you know, maybe some guy who likes uh, Led Zeppelin. And that stuff only works good at, after midnight, too. So, <laughs> so let's, um, let's put that in, in mind with the thing, maybe with the restriction case down the road. The music does change because, um, you know, everything, just little things like that. That's all I'm concerned about. You know, I like to be a good neighbor, and, and with the gentleman here, we could communicate and work it out. So that's yeah, my So concern. the conditions uh, specifically provide only for a lounge that will host jazz performances. Um, weekdays from 5 to 11. We should probably um, add to that that it's acoustic. Um, but then uh, if uh, the tenant wishes to change business activities or hours, they have to um, submit proposed changes to the planning department before they can do anything. It's also about the soundproofing. If, if maybe the sound acoustic, because I mean, I, it seems like it's going to be a very popular place. So if the noise gets loud to the decibel point, if, we, you know, if you have that where you can, you can check it, and then if we have to, you know, if there's something that has to be done, you know, in order to keep his business thriving, because it's, just, you know, it's a, I don't want to stifle his business at all. I want him to be successful there. So I want to be, I want to be a good neighbor, like he's going to be a good neighbor. So that's what we want. So, Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Donna Gamola. Thank you. Um, I just heard about this today in the local newspaper, and I was kind of um, shocked that we didn't get as tenants in the area information. Our landlord did not. We live at 1174, myself and Carol. Um, I've lived in the property for 12 years. Carol's been there for 24 years. Our um, apartments face the parking lot in the back, um, if you look at the map, um, where their uh, lounge is on the outside of our parking lot. Um, we've had a lot of trouble with Clooney's with broken glass, um, trash being thrown over the fence, lighters. Um, I'm sure nobody wants this to happen, but it happens a lot um, or did in the past, so that's a concern of mine. I love jazz, too, and I would like to understand a little bit more what acoustical means. Um, when I go and listen to jazz, even acoustical, there usually is a drum, and there's usually possibly a keyboard or um, bass. And again, what the other gentleman said about the brick walls, um, the, the bass, you can put earplugs in and try and sleep, but the bass still goes through these cinder block walls. I'm much further away than my neighbor here. Um, also, I'm very concerned because the lounge area that butts up to 1150 Greenwood, these are studio apartments. They're paying $1,800 to live there, two floors. So there will be six or at least four apartments that are butted right up to the wall, and two of them have school age, very young children. So school nights and music. Um, if it is loud and that, that um, area outside the lounge area or whatever you call it, the backyard area, um, 
gets pretty rambunctious. It's a fun place for people to be, um, but there is a lot of noise um, just from the the people outside. Uh, with the back door open, the music carries out. So again, I don't understand what the soundproofing is, but um, at Clooney's it was very loud. Uh, so I'm, I'm concerned about the children in the neighborhood. Um, I'm hoping that this will be a, a little bit of a, a different group of people. We have a lot of alcohol problems on the street after Clooney's closed. Um, and I live right on Greenwood. Myself and three apartments are right there. We have a brick, um, Edging. People sit there, smoke their cigarettes. They sit there and wait for taxis to come because they've had too much to drink. We have called the police many times because of um, fights, verbal fights between um, couples that are quite nasty in the in the words that are used. Um, I know this is something we can take care of by calling the police, but the lateness of this music to me is is not going to be very good for me. I can't afford to move. My rent is about as high as I can handle, and I work and get up at four o'clock in the morning. So when I and I work weekends, so at twelve o'clock, let alone at ten o'clock, is even hard for me. Um, and has been in the past. So there's a lot of concerns that I have. Um, and again, uh, I'd really like to know what the, how they're going to contain it with the bass and other instruments. We'll, we'll ask that question. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank so you, Donna. Can I, can I ask you one quick question? Have you heard the noise recently? Yes. Yeah. Not anywhere near as bad, but yes, we have. Thanks, Donna. Can staff or the applicant speak to the sound question about soundproofing, if there's additional or if any, or um, how that might work, and also about the base coming through? Can... Thank you. Um, so with respect to the soundproofing, we, uh, we have re-engineered the, uh, the back room. We've added uh, drywalls, we've uh, done insulation, we, um, we have put significant amount of uh, insulation foam, uh, a professional. Uh, we have uh, professional um, curtains that are so thick that you only find them in uh, upper houses. Uh, that are meeting all the fire codes uh, of California. And I want to emphasize that we have a Yamaha Grand Piano, a C3. The noise level is at the level of the Yamaha Grand Piano. Um, and we play, it's a jazz club, so we play double bass, uh, contra bass, as opposed to electric basses. Uh, that makes a big difference in the noise level. And to my knowledge, um, there hasn't been any complaints uh, with respect to noise level. Uh, it's actually so quiet uh, in the jazz lounge uh, that sometimes it worries me. <laughs> uh, so, um, Quick question. Do you keep the back door shut to prevent noise from spilling out onto the patio from indoors? So as you know, there is a patio area uh, that uh, has been a concern. The, uh, during the entertainment, the, uh, the, door, the door to the patio is closed, and there is a, an additional layer. I mean, this is a, it's a thick door, and there is an additional uh, curtain uh, treated for sound specifically in front of it. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And I just wanted to confirm again what was already said, which before is before you before you go, sir, uh, would you have a problem with a condition that required that the door be closed um, while music is playing? I have no problem with that. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. So um, I believe that um, we we already discussed that should there be problems with the noise exceeding what's already allowed in the code, that that, that staff can actually follow up and adjust hours. Correct. So if there, if, it, if it becomes a problem, there is recourse for the community. Okay. 
All right, I have one more speaker card, um, Kathy Palmer Lowen. I'm sorry if I did that right or wrong. <laughs> everybody. I just wanted to speak in support of the club. Um, I have a, a family that's involved in jazz and really excited to see a jazz club in San Carlos. I think it's fun to have some place to go other than a restaurant and something different. I think it'll be good for our town. Um, we've been there. It doesn't seem to be a noisy, a rambunctious crowd of people. Um, so I just wanted to speak in support. Thanks. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the public that wants to speak on this item? All right, go ahead. Go ahead and come on up. You can do that afterwards. I just also wanted to speak in support of this. Um, Could you say your name, please? Romaine Lopreet. Okay. Um, the people that went to Clooney's before, I think the age group was much different than the people who are going to be going to a jazz club. I think all of those sorts of concerns of arguing and crashing bottles and things being flung over the fence or whatever. I don't think that's going to be happening. I, I can't say for sure, but I have a son who went to Clooney's, and I just know that age group is different. He's probably not going to be going to listen to jazz <laughs> at, on a Friday night. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm all for this place. And I think it'd be great to have some place in San Carlos where you can go where you don't have to eat. Right now, if I want to go on a Friday or a Saturday night, it seems like I can go to San Carlos and I can eat Italian food on Laurel Street, and I think this is a nice change. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, okay. Uh, um, gentlemen, you can speak, and then whoever else. If you, Would you fill out a card while he's up here speaking? Thanks. Would you mind letting us know your name, please? Yes. Kevin Clay. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm here to uh, speak in favor of the club. Um, it's a wonderful thing for San Carlos to extend their arms to that. And I would truly say, and I'm sure I would have probably 100% um, agreement that anything better than Clooney's is going to be a step in the right direction. Clooney's was wonderful for a certain crowd that we really don't need in San Carlos. Um, I, I commiserate with the gentleman who owns a building next door. I own a building right next door to the patio. Um, and it's a single mother with two children. Um, but she knew what she was getting into when she did this, and she still does okay. Uh, so I'm just hopeful to let this let the conditions lie where they are. Don't add any more because I think the city has enough teeth to respond to what they need. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, I'm Steve Sanflip. I'm the landlord okay. of the property. I can tell you that Clooney's was an absolute disaster for the city of San Carlos. Uh, I had more complaints about all the things you were talking about than you can shake a stick at. The problem is I was in legal turmoil with those people. I finally had to evict them after I found out they were pushing drugs. And so here we are today. And I made a very thoughtful search for somebody to replace them. And I thought that a jazz club in San Carlos would add a little culture to what's going on. Acoustical music is very lighthearted. It's not like amplified music, which was one of the reasons why I agreed to, to go into contract with uh, Pasquale. So, I think it's really going to be an uplifting event for the city of San Carlos. I've had lots of good comments back from all the folks that I know in the community. So, thank you. Anyone else? Can, I just say one thing? Can you please come up to the mic, please? No, I I agree that Clooney's maybe was a little different, but we had broken glass in our parking lot last week. And it did come from over the fence. Could you approach? Could you talk oh, to the? Yeah. I'm sorry. We did have broken glass over the fence. So you know, maybe a sign up, whatever you can do. But um, when people drink, things happen, even with good people. So, okay, thank you. All right. I might entertain a motion to close public hearing. I move that we close public hearing. Second. Um, roll call. I mean, all in favor? No, wait, we do a roll call. <laughs> Sorry. Commissioner Harper Patterson? Yes. Commissioner uh, Marsters? Um, I thought we were going to potentially add some additional. This is closing the public oh, hearing. Yes. <laughs> Commissioner Silverman? Yes. And Vice Chair Bergman? Yes. Okay. All right. So, discussion? Can um, I quote the music man? Go ahead. <laughs> Would you? No. 
So I think um, in in item number one in the draft conditional use permit, we wanted to add acoustic jazz performances. It, yep. And then also it doesn't have uh, the ending time written, at least not in mine. So it's 5 to midnight on weekends and holidays. That's correct. And staff was going to make note of that. So thank you for mentioning that. But that is correct. And then um, I th believe uh, Commissioner Silberman. You yes, were I'd also like a condition that the door be closed uh, when music is being played. So we can just add that under number eight? Yeah. OK. And then wasn't there one more, which was if there's a change in the type of music? That's that's in here already. It's in here already. Yeah, that's in here already. Is there any other discussion? All right. Um, I move that the Planning Commission grant approval of the request for a conditional use permit to Dr. Pascal B. Tiam of Savannah Jazz to operate a new jazz lounge at 1189 Laurel Street. Uh, APN 051-344-470, uh, subject to the conditions in the conditional use permit with the additional conditions that the uh, rear door of the patio be closed when music is being played, um, that the uh, music that is permitted under the conditional use permit be acoustic jazz only, and that um, the uh, ending time on the weekends and holidays is... Midnight. Midnight. Do the second. And, and during the week, it's no, ten. That it? That's in there already. Okay. And that's it. Okay. Second. Second. And roll call. Commissioner Harper Pedersen. Yes. Commissioner Marsters. Yes. Commissioner Silverman. Yep. And Vice Chair Bergman. Yes. Okay. Motion passes. All right, um, Jesse. Thank uh, you. It, just as a clarification, when we say weekends, we mean Fridays and Saturdays, right? What is it? Staff will clarify in just a minute. I mean, I was voting for Fridays and Saturdays. Yeah. <laughs> So for the record, that was Fridays and Saturdays and holidays. Thank you. I caught up on my Facebook, so that worked out well. Uh, item B. How many likes did you have? I always get a lot of likes. Item B, consideration of amendments to the San Carlos Zoning Ordinance, Title 18 of the San Carlos Municipal Code, to define the formula business and establish a permit process for the formula business use, uses in downtown core area, which encompasses 600, 700, and 800 blocks of Laurel Street, 1100 block of San Carlos Avenue, and the south side only of the 1200 block of San Carlos Avenue. And I think we have a presentation from Laura. Uh, yes, we do. Um, I'll go ahead and start the presentation okay. off. Good evening, Chair Gutierrez and Planning Commissioners. Uh, the item before you tonight is staff's proposal to address formula business uses as directed by the City Council late last year. Upon receiving this direction, staff from the City's Economic Development Division and Planning Division worked closely together to conduct the necessary evaluation and produced, uh, and produced regulatory language to meet the needs and expectations that gave rise to this proposal. So joining the planning division um, in tonight's presentation is Nell Sealander, Economic Development Coordinator, who will provide some uh, background and analysis. Thereafter, I will guide the commission through the proposed regulations. Uh, but before I hand it over to Nell, I'd just like to thank both Nell and Laura Russell for their efforts to carry out the City Council Directive. So, Nell. Uh, good evening, uh, members of the Planning Commission. It's great to meet you all. Um, I'm here to present a bit about why we're here tonight discussing formula businesses and the background research and community outreach we conducted that led us to the proposed zoning ordinance amendments before you. So, 
The City Council passed an urgency ordinance on November 23rd, 2015, imposing interim zoning on all new formula business uses wishing to locate in the downtown core area. The Council then extended the urgency ordinance for 120 days, beginning on December 14th, to provide staff with the opportunity to conduct community outreach, research best practices, and draft an ordinance for Planning Commission and City Council consideration. So the interim zoning, which will remain in effect until April 13th, requires formula business uses to obtain a conditional use permit prior to opening in the downtown. And it does not apply to existing businesses. The purpose of this urgency ordinance was to allow the public a forum to weigh in on formula business uses in our downtown and to preserve the unique small town character of downtown San Carlos. Before the adoption of the urgency ordinance, the city did not have the authority to, to impose reasonable conditions on a formula business use if the use was otherwise permitted. So there's no distinction between formula and non-formula businesses. This gave the public and council some pause as formula business uses often have specific impacts on the community as it relates to design and aesthetics, diversity of business type, and then the concentration of uses. So the urgency ordinance addressed these concerns on an interim basis. So now I'm going to briefly walk you through how we arrived at the proposed zoning ordinance amendments, including examining some historic precedent, conducting benchmarking and best practices research, and documenting and analyzing existing downtown businesses, and lastly, engaging stakeholders in the community in a discussion about regulating formula businesses. So in the past, the city has imposed moratoriums on certain uses and interim zoning in order to facilitate development of uses compatible with the city's general plan, and a few examples are provided in the staff report. Additionally, the zoning ordinance currently regulates financial institutions and personal services in the downtown. This was done for much the same reason that regulating formula business uses is being considered, to prevent multiplication and concentration of uses that impair the vitality and diversity of downtown San Carlos. Next, we looked at cities throughout the country and in California in particular that regulate formula business uses. And some co commonalities among these cities and their ordinances really rose to the top. And those include that many of these cities that regulate formula businesses have a very strong sense of place that their, ordinance, their ordinances seek to address, to preserve, to enhance that sense of place. Um, they also acknowledge that some formula business can be good and help the local economy. And they also use the use permit process as the review process for formula businesses. And lastly, all of the definitions agree that what makes a formula a formula is having some contract or agreement that stipulates what the business look like or how it behave. So where definitions and ordinances sort of differ is in the number of locations that constitutes a formula. So, for example, San Francisco defines a formula as 11 locations anywhere in the world. Palo Alto says 10 in the U.S. Benicia takes a stricter approach with four locations in the nine-county Bay Area. So there's a range of possibilities. And then, of course, the findings for approval for a formula business use differ by jurisdiction and are usually specific to that jurisdiction's character. Can I stop you for a second? Sure. So um, I'm looking at 18.41 in our um, packet and comparing it to your presentation. And I was wondering um, whether there's an and missing. Does it have to be 10 or more business locations and is required by contractual or other arrangement to maintain uh, any of the following? Sorry, I'm just trying to pick up what you're looking at. So is this in the chapter 18, 20, oh, 24? Yeah, terms, terms and definitions. 18.4, yeah. exhibit C. 18.41.020. Yeah, Correct, yeah. exhibit C, yeah. Oh. Here we go. And in looking at it, um, Commissioner Silberman, um, mm -hmm. staff would agree that it, it, it would be appropriate to add the and. That's a, 
Or so this is so it's a both. It, it require it, in order to be a formula business, there has to be both. It has to be more than ten, and um, it has to have some some contractual or other arrangement. Both of those have to be true. Both of those things. Um, I don't know if the city attorney might consider having an A and a B rather than uh, than this. That's not something you need to answer right now. Well, I was just trying to follow up to just to make sure I understand the the, the comment, Commissioner. Um, Because there is a potential um, that a formula business may be a totally company store formula business, so there wouldn't necessarily be a contractual or other arrangement to maintain the standard uh, characteristics. So it would be more of an and or. So it would be. I think it would be more of an and or to, to cover what the intention I think is of this um, proposed ordinance. Well, I guess that. I mean, that kind of. That that's kind of the key issue I'm trying to understand now. So, say you've got a a yogurt store, um, and there's 11 of them, uh, but you own all of them. It's not a franchise. Um, you don't have a contract or other arrangement that says it needs to be in a particular way because you own them all. Um, would that be a formula business just because there's 11 of them? Um, that, that may be more for the planning staff, but I think that's the intention to cover both scenarios. Um, and although I, uh, this, for an example, there are some major franchise um, or um, corporations that have both company stores and franchises, and they both operate under the same model of business. So we're trying to capture both the company store and and that, but the language I think then from from your comments, and or. It, it should be or because because there could be um, standardized features. And and now I'm going to ask or, you the other the yeah. flip side of that. What if there's only four stores, and but there's a a contractual agreement to have the same exact merchandise that um, the other three stores have and have the same, say, facade on the building. Um, so now we're getting to less than 10 if we put an or in there. Well, it sounds yeah, I actually like it liked the end. An um, and I mean, just to, again, and I, I don't think this is a conflict in, in any stretch of the imagination, but footwear, et cetera, which is on Laurel, um, is owned by my extended family. And I think there, there is, there's either nine or ten of them now. Mm -hmm. um, it's a completely family-owned business. Just because there's ten of them, it becomes a, a, a even though that it still becomes a formula business that's just because the, there's ten the of them. Reading. Yeah, that's the way it's reading. And Unless it's an and. If if it was an and, then. But it sounds like the intention of staff was that it's an or. It's an or. Actually, this, the intention. I'm sorry. Do you mind if I jump in? The, the, the intention is that now. it's an and, and that a company store would fall under the other arrangement. So if it's a privately owned family store that has 12 locations, that would it would conform to these standardized characteristics by other arrangement. So contractual would be a franchise. So the intention was that if you get to 10 locations oh. that all look the same, then it goes to to a CUP, to a conditional use permit. Okay, so the intention is and. Yeah, okay, I, I, okay, I so that, I misread it then. That makes sense with that reading. I, I agree okay. now. Thanks. So I would back, go back and probably suggest an A and a B, but do it however um, is consistent with the city code and however you want to do yeah, it. I will. Let me, let me think about that while you guys continue your deliberations. We talked about that. Okay, going right along. Okay, um, this map provides a visual of the area regulated by the urgency ordinance. You'll notice in the staff report and in Lisa's part of the presentation that the area has changed in the proposed zoning ordinance amendments, and that's to take into account the built character of the downtown. So you'll notice that this map differs a little bit further in the presentation. But as you can see here, about half of the formula business uses in the downtown core are retail and restaurants, whereas the other half are services such as banks and uh, real estate brokerages. And you'll also notice they're very evenly distributed. So we aren't seeing a, a 
strong concentration of formula business uses anywhere in the downtown right now. So we inventoried all of the businesses, both formula and non-formula, in the map area and found that 18%, or 22 out of 119 first floor businesses in the downtown are formula business uses. 10 are banks or real estate brokerages, one is a shipping store, four are retailers, six are quick service or convenience restaurants, and we have our first full service formula restaurant in Pachi's. So despite the fact that formula business uses are often associated with a higher sales tax revenue, the formula business uses in our downtown tend to be exempt from sales tax or pay very little because of high volume, small to-go orders. Um, and despite the fact that they make up 18% of sort of the physical space of downtown, they account for just 10% of sales tax revenue. So while we were researching best practices and documenting downtown San Carlos, we also outreached to the community to gather feedback on regulate, regulating formula business uses. Um, staff gave presentations on the topic to a special meeting of business and property owners in the downtown. Also gave a presentation at two Chamber of Commerce events and at the last regular meeting of the Economic Development Advisory Commission. And we received some valuable feedback uh, from these meetings. Um, specific comments included that maintaining a mix or balance of businesses, both large and small, chain and independent, matters to the vibrancy of downtown. And landlords and realtors shared that formula business uses often provide much needed income stability and cautioned against regulating formula business uses. Some small business owners were also concerned that larger formula business uses could afford running a loss for a period of time in order to get a foothold in the community. So you can tell that these comments ranged from the economic to sort of a more, um, you know, locational concern. The Economic Development Advisory Commission members considered assemblages of multiple retail storefronts um, to be by a formula business used to be more of a threat to downtown's character than a formula business just occupy, occupying one small storefront. And those same commissioners also thought that a business use that um, met an underserved need, um, maybe a business that offered a product we don't already have in the downtown was more acceptable than one that would compete with existing businesses. Uh, but without fail, everyone we talked to agreed that formula business uses should be required to address the design of their storefronts and their signage with a particular focus on making it human scaled and complementing the downtown character. That was a big, big comment. Now we'll turn it over to Lisa. Okay, great. Thank you, Nell. Um, and so, so, can I ask one more question? Of course. So, in your research, did you find um, any instances where formula business was defined to include uh, to only be triggered by more than ten, like say fifteen or twenty or twenty-five? Was ten, was it always ten? I think the highest I found was twelve. 11 or 12, but no higher. And a lot of them are actually after one, just the existence of another location. Um, in one of the attachments to the staff report, there's a list of the number of locations in the geographic area of the cities that we looked at. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you, Nell. So with all of that um, evaluation and background, um, obviously economic development um, division and planning divisions work together to develop well, what would be the right language um, to meet you know, the spirit of this intention? How might we regulate business? So I know we just took a moment and talked about the definition. But again, I think that is um, part of the reason why we're here tonight. We do want feedback that we can take back in your recommendation to take forward to the city council for their consideration. So out, out of all of this research, um, essentially what that would amount to in our proposal is to modify uh, three sections of the zoning ordinance, and that's provided in um, exhibits to the staff report, exhibits A, B, and C. So the first section would modify the land use regulation uh, table within the zoning ordinance, specifically the land use um, regulation table pertaining to mixed-use districts. Again, the mixed-use districts make up um, 
um, a significant portion of the downtown core. So what's really um, included in that exhibit is uh, to alert users with a notation that there is a section of the code that needs to be um, addressed for formula business use types. The second section of the amendment, and this is really the centerpiece because it contains um, the permit requirements and the proposed findings for approval. So in section 18.23, which is um, within the zoning ordinance um, set forth as standards for specific uses and activities, this section would house the formula business um, regulatory um, um, uh, language. Um, this section addresses certain <coughs> uses such as second units, home occupations, formula businesses is proposed to be housed within that location as well. And then finally, um, and most importantly, um, what does it mean to be a formula business? So in section 18.41, we have proposed a definition of what it means to be a formula business. And um, we talked about this just a minute ago. So as you can see here, how we defined it um, is that a formula business means a use that has 10 or more other business locations in the United States. We decided to use United States rather than a re local regional aspect and, and, and of course limited, limited it from worldwide. And then as discussed, the intention is that it has to also have a component, uh, a required uh, component that ad addresses a contractual or other arrangement to maintain any of the following standardized characteristics, whether that's merchandise, specific menu type, the type of services offered, decor, uniforms, architecture, facade, color schemes, signage, as well as trademark and service mark. So it was intentionally um, intended to have the and. So thanks for allowing us to clarify that. And as far as where it would um, apply, um, as shown here on this uh, diagram, highlighted in yellow, it would apply um, to storefronts along the 600, 700, and 800 blocks of Laurel Street, along the 1100 block of San Carlos Avenue, Can but be limited to the south side only of the 1200 block of San Carlos Avenue. Because the original map that was shown actually pointed out two of these businesses on the north side of the 1200 block. Did it? Let's go back. Well, that's the, that, yeah, that was the one before. That's where the urgency ordinance covered, but because of sort of the character of the Sam Trans building, 1250 uh, San Carlos Avenue, which takes up that whole block face there, um, we didn't feel like it really fit in already sort of with the character of what we imagined this would really apply to. So the difference between the, 11, the north side of the 1100 block of San Carlos with the many individual distinct storefronts and then the Sam Trans building, we felt like it didn't merit inclusion in this amendment. Okay. So this is um, the area that would apply under the, propo the, the proposal that staff is presenting this evening. And um, as far as which, how it would apply, well, it would apply for all new formula businesses that meet the definition that was just presented. Um, existing formula businesses would be held um, under this requirement to undergo a conditional use permit if they chose to relocate within the applicable area that was just described to you on the map. And it would also apply for existing formula businesses that want to expand by an amount of 10% or more of floor area. One of the other features of the proposal, because design was a common uh, theme that ran throughout a lot of the feedback that was received by the different stakeholders, um, we are also proposing that um, there be a current concurrent processing requirement, which would re require any formula business um, to also bring forward um, its application for a signed permit. Any kind of exterior modifications that it may want to do to that storefront so that all of those can be reviewed together as one application uh, that would be reviewed and um, evaluated by the Planning Commission. 
And as far as finding goes, um, again, through a lot of the research that was done, um, staff is proposing um, three findings specific to a formula business use type. So first of all, the um, standard use permit findings that are already currently codified in the zoning ordinance would apply to the application, as well as three additional ones. So as shown here on the slide, the three additional ones include the design of the proposed use complements the city's unique small town character and architecture, that the use will enhance the economic health of the downtown core area, and to provide a little bit more of a background and um, to, to try and try and frame this uh, finding, um, staff also added um, the following language, which is in considering this finding, the decision-making body uh, may also consider economic factors such as vacancy and unmet needs. And at this time, staff is proposing to remove um, the reference to a vacancy rate um, and instead just leave it as vacancy because there could be um, you know, a possibility that a particular storefront has been vacant for quite some time, and it might be a beneficial uh, use to have that storefront occupied. So we are um, changing that to remove um, the reference to a rate. And then finally, the use would contribute to a balance of independent businesses and formula businesses within the downtown core area. Future work um, that is not part of the um, proposed resolution this evening and not part of the exhibits that are part of your packet has to do with design. Again, uh, multiple times a lot of the comments were centered on design. How does the building, excuse me, the proposed formula business use look and fit in with the downtown area? So based upon those comments received um, with respect to design, um, we, want, we wanted to bring back um, to the commission and hopefully we can get some feedback from you this evening, that would add new design criteria to the design criteria uh, design review criteria that's already part of the um, part of the zoning ordinance. Um, so some preliminary language that staff has um, drafted and that is included in your staff report addresses high quality materials, compatibility in color, um, looking at limiting or prohibiting color washing an entire storefront. You know, a lot of times some of the formula businesses have one color or one particular look. So that um, was a um, proposed design review criteria that we wanted to add. Um, we also um, are looking at adding in design review criteria to address signage in particular, that it be in line with the architectural aesthetic of the proposed storefront for, where, for which the building formula business use wants to locate, and that it not obscure any um, key architectural features. And then uh, finally, that there has to be um, some sort of uh, way to address scale, that we really want to have the signage be um, in good taste with the with the scale and proportion of the storefront, and especially that it be legible, oriented towards um, pedestrian legibility as opposed to um, auto leg legibility. So the next steps uh, following um, tonight's um, recommendation um, would be the first reading of the ordinance, which is scheduled for February 22nd. The second reading of the ordinance um, would follow on March 14th. And should that be approved by the city council, um, the code amendments would go into place on April 13th. So in particular this evening, we're looking for feedback from the Planning Commission on the proposed amendment language, and also any comments you may have on preliminary design review criteria for storefronts. This is the uh, proposed motion, should you choose to make it, and staff is available for any questions you may have. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question on the necessary findings. See, the use will contribute to a balance. I'm a little concerned that the word balance almost when you think of balance, I think of scales, I think of 50-50, and I don't think that that's what the, I don't think that's necessarily what's meant. I'm not sure if there's a better way to word that, if it's a blend or if it's just a, I'm, I'm just, I'm just a little concerned that, you know, if we, if we put the word balance in there, we have something comes in and you now we have 51% that are, that are, you know, uh, private and, and others are formula. I, I'm just a little, I don't know if there's a better way to, I don't know if there's better verbiage for that, and or if that's just me being a little bit picky. You're saying C1C? Yeah, it's um, yeah. The use will contribute to a balance of independent businesses and formula business. I understand the intent, but I don't know if I don't right. know if that's problematic. Yeah. And 
and I and I believe staff would agree with you on that particular um, note. Um, there wasn't an intention to have it be, you know, 50-50. Did you want to follow up on that? Or another word we considered was mix. I so think a mix or blend or mix. Or, yeah, I, I think balance lends you to think of. Yeah, and I don't think we want that. It's just was my input. And I have something closely related to that because the the word balance kind of um, and what where I found it was on page seven where it says the use will contribute to a balance of independent businesses and formula businesses in the downtown core area and that suggests that there will be some sort of balance in the future and I'm kind of curious as what you sort of define that balance as. Are we heavy in one direction or the other? Are you looking to... Uh, I, I think we, we probably intended more mix than balance. It was just a word choice that we landed on after a lot of community feedback on this topic. Um, but the reason why we did a lot of research into what our downtown looks like now is so that there is a point of comparison. We also looked at the sort of retail cores of other cities that regulate formula retail and that don't and sort of what their mix or balance is. So the intent was to provide, and Al, correct me if I'm wrong, a, a, a point at which you can evaluate whether or not there's too much, too little, or how a specific business impacts the current environment. Point of reference, basically. Exactly. So as you interpret this, this would apply to a dry cleaner that has 10 locations, because they all provide dry cleaning, and they've got the same name? Well, we have the, the second requirement, too. They have, they have to have if they the just incidentally had the same name, I guess that wouldn't apply. And if some businesses just accidentally have the same name as other businesses, but if it had this, you know, it was. But if they have the same name and they've trademarked it, then, and they've got 10 of them, then they need to get a conditional use permit? That's the way it's, it's, it's not, we're not trying to, um, by this ordinance, affect the um, underlying uses in our code. It's, it's just trying to define this extra level of business that does um, require this extra level of review. So it's not um, really intended to change any of the other definitions in our code about uses. So I, I may not be answering your question but directly. I just, but I don't know. Sometimes I feel like we take a, you know, a sledgehammer, you know, <laughs> but anyway, okay. Let me uh, throw a scenario out there, and I'm trying to figure out how this actually changes the mix, uh, but I think the way that it's worded kind of uh, um, triggers something off. So say, uh, say a, a formula business is classified as formula right now that's existing in 700 block of Laurel, wants to move to the 800 block of Laurel, and they're not taking on more space. Maybe they're taking on less space. The way that it's written right now is they're still required to get a conditional use permit, correct? That would be correct because it's a relocation. So how does that, the mix doesn't change. The mix has been the same, right? So that you're triggering off something that doesn't change the mix. If the, the, the purpose of the ordinance is to kind of, uh, you know, uh, have a say in the mix, the mix doesn't change. However, it, it now becomes a cumbersome issue for the, the um, the business owner that's already been at the 700 block and technically grandfathered under existing zoning um, and puts them in a different category and for that matter they, they, they you know the conditional use permit doesn't have to be approved so it doesn't mix it mix it mess with the mix I don't know if I'm, if I'm kind of clear on what I, I'm trying I, to say. I think I understand your point, right, because the mix is the same. So in terms of if we were to look at how are we to define, I mean, what area contains the mix, it's the area that we showed up on the map. So it's not a block-by-block block evaluation. It would allow us to consider the entire area. And um, if, in fact, there was an existing formula business, I think through our discussions that we have had, um, the mix would, you know, be unaltered. So on one hand, you'd be able, you could be able to make 
make the finding that this doesn't, you know, um, create some sort of offset of the existing mixes within the downtown core. So it gives the, the commission that flexibility to have that conversation and make the findings um, in that particular context. But what if, for example, there were very few, <clears throat> I mean, if there were a lot of formula businesses in one area and this business moves into that particular block, wouldn't you want the flexibility to say, maybe we don't want mm -hmm. eight formula businesses in a row? Yeah. Um, and so this would give you that ability to monitor that um, by requiring the conditional use permit. That would be correct as well. So that's this is one of the things that we, there was a lot of time was spent on is to really add in uh, the flexibility to be able to look at this from a number of different vantage points. It provides the decision making body with that flexibility. It was intentional. Did you yeah, absolutely. It could both scenarios work for that finding. Uh, I'm going to throw out another hypothetical. So, what happens when an existing store suddenly becomes part of a group that now consists of more than 10 stores? Is it redefined as a formula business? And does that change anything? So, say the business comes into town and it's it's the ninth store. This doesn't apply to existing businesses until they want to enlarge right, or move. If they enlarge or move, then yes, they're a formula business. But it's not an existing store. It comes in, it becomes the ninth store. Will it get any store that suddenly becomes part of a group still be defined as a formula business? <clears throat> sure, but so, it, it won't matter because unless it unless they're already here, they're grand. They'll be grand person in unless they okay. okay. Unless they want to expand by more than ten percent or move. So you would right, but would you define them as a formula business once the sure, number gets over ten? Sure, but it's irrelevant. I mean, to them unless they want to expand. Unless they want to expand or move. Okay. Public comment time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're still trying to think of hypotheticals here. Okay, public comment. Let's see, I have one speaker card right now, Les Girdlestone. Thank you. I'm Les Girdlestone. I'm representing uh, the Girdlestone Family Trust, and, which my father controls, and the Girdlestone Family Trust that I control. But based on Mr. Silberman's comments, which I found favorable. I have a question for Mr. Rubens. Um, if your family owns a business in the core district, should you recuse yourself? It's, I mean, it's, it, no, I appreciate that. It's, I don't think so. I mean, it's my um, second cousin. Um, I, don't, I don't think that, uh, that's a conflict. It, uh, yeah. The appearance of impropriety, and I'm not questioning. No, no, I, look, I don't take offense, and I'm happy to refuse myself, but I, I think by the definition of conflict, it's a, it's a second cousin. Uh, Commissioner Silverman does not have an FPPC conflict. He doesn't have any financial interest in it. What you're talking about is a common law conflict um, that it's up to the individual commissioner to decide whether or not they can make an unbiased review of, of the matter at hand. Um, and then there's one other factor on this one, since this is a legislative recommendation. The Planning Commission is not the final reviewing body, it's just making a recommendation on it. And then legislative acts are treated differently than quasi-judicial actions, so if this were actually a use permit, there might be a different answer than considering proposed legislation for the council to review. Okay. The, Girdles, the two Girdlestone Trusts, if you will, own 10 commercial properties in the city of San Carlos. They're all on the El Camino or Laurel Street. My father has three properties on the 700 block. You would know those as the Reading Bug, the Hallmark Store, and the building that contains the Chef Shop and Holly's Dress Shop. We, the family, my father, brought those businesses into San Carlos. We didn't need a planning commission to help bring them in. We didn't need to see the council to help bring them in. And I think we make very good decisions without another layer of bureaucracy on top of all this. But 
while I'm opposed to additional bureaucracy and so on, let me give my opinions. I've read through all the reports, the staff's report. I found it to be arbitrary, subjective, capricious, and unreasonable. I also found a lot of unintended consequences within the language in that I think it's giving a message that San Carlos is not business friendly. If you want to come to San Carlos and you're a successful business and you've reached a point of having 10 locations, you know what? We don't think we want you in this town. I don't care if it's Jamba Juice or whatever, you're giving a message out that says, you're not welcome. We're gonna make you jump through hoops based on standards that are kind of subjective and warm and fuzzy, and we're not quite sure. Maybe fill out some paperwork and maybe we'll get to you. We'll let you know. I also feel with this unintended consequences that you do not know which businesses you are telling not to come here. Maybe there's a business that's thinking of San Carlos, but now they're seeing what the city wants to do, and they're saying, hmm, maybe we don't want to waste our time and money trying to get into San Carlos. Unintended, unintended consequences. Also, I don't think we know, we don't know, no one in this room knows who the next Starbucks is. We don't know who the next Starbucks is or next Bundt Cake or whatever the case may be, but by the time they're 10 stores or more, they may not be interested in coming to San Carlos. You may already have set up rules and regs that just say, nah, don't worry about it. Don't, don't come here. Now, when I read this, I said, you know, Apple Store has more than 10 locations. Who's going to call Tim Cook and say, you know, we're going to put big regulations and hoops for you to come into San Carlos? Or maybe we don't even want you in San Carlos because you have arbitrary, uh, subjective rules that haven't been defined. Um, now, the businesses that are in San Carlos, be it the Reading Bug, Hallmark, the Shoe Store, whatever, they're not competing with other businesses up and down Laurel Street. They're not competing with Stanford Shopping Center. They're not competing with Hillsdale. They're competing with the world. And what I mean by that is they have to compete with Amazon, Google, eBay, Zappos, whatever the case may be. Somebody be sitting in their house on White Oaks Avenue, White Oak Way, pick up their iPad, order a book for their three-year-old kid, and have Google deliver it within one hour. Mm -hmm. So you're really trying to confine or control a three block area that the landlords, I think, property owners have done a good job of. There's nothing in here that addresses the property owners. You see a business such as the Reading Bug, the shoe store, and that's what you see, but there's a business before that business, and that is the business of owning property. It takes a lot of capital. We have to adhere to all the rules and regs, but we have to pay the mortgage. We have to pay property taxes. We have to pay insurance. We have to pay maintenance. And I didn't see anything in here. And how long is it going to take to process this new rule? So if there's an empty building or somebody has moved out, in a hypothetical, maybe Gordon Biersch calls and says, hey, we'd like your space. Well, they got more than 10 locations. Apple has more than 10 locations. All sorts of people have more than 10 locations. How long is it going to take for the city council, the planning commission, and whomever to come up and make a decision? And I don't see any requirements on what the decision is. I see nice words for definition of what constitutes. But who is specifically going to say, we will process that in 10 days, two weeks, one month? How long does the property owner have to sit and wait? I don't see any language in there with regards to that. But I do have some recommendations for you. And that is, I truly believe, let the marketplace decide. The citizens of San Carlos, the community, the workers who come to San Carlos, they'll vote with their pocketbook, be it Jamba Juice or anyone else. They'll vote with their pocketbook. I was raised in San Carlos. I've been here since, what, three or four years old. It's always evolving. It's always changing. 
but you're trying to control that. And I don't think you can do that. We don't need another layer of bureaucracy. If you were to rent your personal residence out, I don't think you'd want to have to go to a committee and say, please approve my tenant. And maybe the committee has subjective requirements. I'm sorry, you can't rent your house to anyone who owns an SUV. We don't like SUVs. We're not happy with that. And you know, the city's kind of tired of seeing so many Mercedes and Beamers. It doesn't fit our image, so you can't have those either. And I'm trying to bring a point to you as a property owner, as a business owner, you're just putting more requirements on us. So I would like to see the marketplace take cut, excuse me, like, let the marketplace decide. The citizens will vote with their wallets. And um, if you're gonna go through, where are the time frames? And I'd like to know where the decision point is. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Is there anybody else that wanted to speak on this matter? Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Um, my name is Vic Bolushian. Um I bought um, 1125 San Carlos Avenue, where the Red Hot Chili Pepper restaurant is 40 years ago, 1976. And my brother and I ran the restaurant, Vic's family restaurant, for 32 years. We sold it about eight years ago. And the person we sold it to lost it, paid rent about six or seven months and then stopped paying rent. Uh, this is about 2010. Uh, took us about 10 months to evict him without rent. To, sat vacant for 13 months until we found a tenant. We basically dropped the rent substantially, gave him 20 years lease and six months free rent to get in. Mm. Basically, it did away with my retirement plan. Uh, that's all, it, it cost me over a quarter million dollars to keep the building, which I had to refinance and get the money back. So everyone who owns a piece of property on San Carlos Avenue or, or six, seven, 800 block of Laurel City is not necessarily wealthy, owns a lot of real estate. My brother and I, it's a small retirement plan for us. I get the shivers thinking about the day if those days come back to me again. If it comes back to me one more time, I'd have to work until I'm 80 years old to retire. 1100 block of San Carlos Avenue, 1200 block of San Carlos is very hard. I don't know if people realize how difficult it is to bring a tenant in there. I know I'm fortunate that the restaurant's there now, is doing fine and is paying my rent. I'm stuck with it for a long, long time. I'll probably never live long enough to finish that lease. My kids will probably inherit it, but nevertheless, and I'm not complaining or anything. I'm not trying to play poor guy here or anything like that. Um, I love this town. Like I said, I've been here since I was 21 years old and I'm 61 now. Um, I couldn't live in a better place. Um, I would never do anything to harm this town. I would never want a store owned by me as the proprietor to own a business, to run a business that's that degrades this town or is not becoming of this town. It's a beautiful place. I feel fortunate the decision I made 40 years ago, even though like I said, I have problems with the property. Um, I start thinking about the time, as you know, economy goes up and down, real estate goes up and down. Right now, I'm probably happy because I get my rent on time. I'm worried that five years later, the situation can turn around. For any reason at all, I lose my tenant or whatever, and the same thing happens again. Parking is very scarce. There are so many um, constraints already owning a property on San Carlos Avenue. Um, other than restaurants, if you really look around, take a look at all the stores that are open in downtown area. How many of them are really successful other than the restaurants? And even though some of them are really successful, some of them just are jobs for people. You know, people own them, they live off of them. The rents are going crazy as it is. I think it's just outrageous what we landlords want for our properties, which even as a landlord, I'm, you know, I can't believe the prices these people want. Uh, no offense to Mr. Girdlestone, I have a lot of respect for his dad, and I know he's one of the better benevolent property owners and very fine man. Um, I know he's not that way, but it's not the case with a lot of newer property owners. You know, we've been around for a long time, and. 
I think we have a little more compassion for our tenants, but I don't think the rest of them do, the newcomers in particular. Um, as I sat here and listened to all of these, unfortunately, I don't have a copy that you have, uh, and I intend to get one, and excuse my ignorance for not getting one in advance, and studying it better. Um, I know arbitrary might be a little too harsh, but I try to make as much sense as I can, and I've, on a good day I would say it's confusing. On a good day I would say there's still room for someone in the city five years from now, Nell might not be there or someone else might not be there, another official might be there and might start abusing that or read more into it than it is or, or think you know, I can interpret this differently. The philosophy of the city might change, might start looking at how much sales tax am I generate out of this instead of that, which maybe I should choose this or should I choose that so I can deny this person. I really think that things should be a little cleaner. Um, I'm not going to tell you what to do with this. Uh, by no means I want to butt into the wisdom of this group. I'm sure I'm going to leave it up to you to make the best decision you can. But in that process, in that endeavor, I really think you should think about complexity that you're going to create for uh, a building. Um, and I know St. Carl's is doing very well, but it's no Burlingame Avenue, it's no University Avenue, uh, and I'm not sure if I ever wanted to be there. But there are a lot of businesses that um, have more than 10 branches, and I use them all the time. That doesn't necessarily constitute a bad thing just because they're big, or they have 12 stores, or 50, or even national or international. You know, I eat at Subway restaurant all the time. You know, I know that's exempt from this rule, but I'm just bringing it as an example. There's nothing wrong with Subway. It's a useful business. I don't think it's uh, exempt. It's not exempt from this rule. Yeah, it it's is exempt. Yeah. The, They're on El Camino. They're on. Oh no! Yeah. But if you wanted to put a Subway, I'm sorry, uh, yeah. I was loose with my language. I meant to say the existing store on El Camino is exempt from this. But uh, down the road, yes, it would be. Uh, and I'm not trying to say bring a subway store on 700 block of St. Carl's Avenue. I, I wouldn't even vote for that. But um, there is some, um, there must be some rule that is clear and cannot be abused by the future staff members or officials of the city. And it also thinks about small property owners who look at their property as a, a retirement plan more so than another way of making obscene money every month. Uh, we want to bring in reasonable tenants, but we don't want it to sit vacant for a while. And I know Nell brought up that if there was an extreme situation where a building was empty, again, all that is arbitrary again. I mean, how long does it have to be empty? Am I close to bankruptcy before the city decides that, or am I losing my building that I worked for for 40 years? Um, you know, when I owned VIX, I worked seven days a week, 14 hours a day. I never had, I spent my entire 20s, 30s, 40s in their 50s. Um, nothing was given to me for free. I worked for it. I uh, earned it. I deserve it. I want it to be my retirement plan. I don't want little small things like this to cause problems someday for me. So in, in making the decisions, I think you should really look into the overall picture. You know, there are some huge developers in town. They're, they're going to tear these things down, build beautiful things. More power to them. If they want to do that, that's fine as long as it's done with taste. And I have 100% confidence in this group, in the city council, that these things will be filtered out properly. And by the time the permits are given, I'm sure those businesses will, will fit this town and they'll be the proper business to place. But don't go into this huge at least if you want to listen to me, um, little sticking points that would cause uh, issues with some businesses that are still good, you know, and, and they're useful, and they might have 20 stores, but they don't look like plastic, they don't look like formula, they, or even if they do, what difference does that make? If it's useful and we all need them, then let's have them, you know. So whatever filtering process you're trying to instill into the code, I think you should just do that carefully so it doesn't cause any harm in the future.
of this town. The town is doing fantastic. You know, the old adage in food business, we used to say, don't fix something that's working. I think sometimes I feel that might be the decision here. It's working. But if you want to upgrade it, like the planning department has always been upgrading this town. That's how it got to where it got to. I take my hat off for what you have done and your predecessors have done. I think they've done a fantastic job of building this town. Um, keep up the good work, but I think some things might be over the top, and just because other cities do it doesn't mean we need to do it. This is, town is so different. I can walk on Laurel Street and say hello to somebody every four minutes or three minutes. Um, it, it has a character that's uh, unbelievable. And uh, again, I'm flattered to be in this town. I'm flattered to own property in this town. I also own the sign works in San Carlos. Uh, I've had that for 15 years. I make most of the signs for this building. City has been very generous to me. Um, but uh, just keep that in mind. That's all I ask. Thank you. I'll fill out a form for you now. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Is there any? Okay. Let's fill out some forms here, too. <laughs> when you get a chance, it's okay. My name's David Carroll. I live here in San Carlos. I own a building on the 800 block of Laurel Street. I um, just wanted to just echo some of the feedback from the last two speakers. I understand, I think, the intent. I just would like to see if there's a way that you can make it a little bit less arbitrary, and if there's some protections in could be put in place somehow for the land uh, landlords in terms of how long does the process take and so forth because I can see scenarios where you know this could go on and on in the meantime you have an empty you know you have an empty space and you're stuck in the middle and it's just really becomes you know arbitrary and sort of whatever the opinion of the day is and you know looking ahead you know many years from now it's hard to predict how that could be so just try to make it more balanced because as they said there's a huge investment um, that goes into maintaining these buildings and finding uh, good tenants and I think in general most of the landlords have done a pretty good job without this ordinance I'm not necessarily saying I'm a hundred percent against it I'm just saying it try to make it more balanced great thank, thank you, you so much and if you can fill out a speaker form, that'd be great. So, oh, absolutely. Thank you. Yes, my name is Ruby Gregorian. I own the uh, Drake building on okay, the corner. Yeah, you your email. Yeah, so go ahead. Go ahead. You're going to read that? No, no, no please address it now. Yeah, because I was going to bring it up, so. Okay, all right. Well, we, uh, did, we did get it and we read it. It is in the public record, but yeah. Go ahead. But please. Go ahead. Well, so I, I just wanted to uh, just uh, say a couple of words. I also bought that building in 1997, and it was supposed to be my retirement building. And uh, uh, I refinanced my home to buy the building, and I love the building, as you can if you see that, I always kept it very clean, very painted. Right. So it, I, I know that it represents San Carlos, and I want to make sure that it looks very good. But I just want to make to uh, bring to your attention that the corner of uh, San Carlos and El Camino is a particularly very difficult location for uh, for uh, retail stores. Uh, and I wrote in my letter that uh, in the past 19 years, I had 18 uh, tenants, and uh, uh, and the only way that I could basically pay my mortgage was because I, I had the AT&T uh, as a tenant and AT&T and uh, of course AT&T has changed, they do business as AT&T but they have changed hands. It was Paracellular, it was, mm -hmm. so, so every one of them came out, but uh, they have been very, uh, although the rent is not very high, but I, I just kept them because it, it, it actually subsidized my two other uh, locations that were just a revolving door. They just came and uh, they couldn't survive. I even brought like Quiznos there, that is a chain store. They couldn't survive because of the parking situation. I had TCBY there. I had High Tech Burrito there. I had Sonoma Valley Bagel. None of them survived. And they just, so what I'm trying to say is that to some extent, I cannot be choosy with the tenant. In other words, if the tenant comes and says that I am Verizon and they want to take that store, if I, if I don't rent it to me, it, it has been a disservice to me because as a landlord, I will suffer a lot. So I think this ordinance is, uh, and I echo all the things that they said, this is kind of an open-ended thing that it could take six months for the planning commission to decide whether I, I can bring that tenant there or not. And, and sometimes some tenants like, I don't know, like even Verizon as an example, they will not, they, they take it for granted that they can go anywhere because they're so big. And if you just tell them, oh, let's go through another 
uh, planning uh, process to see whether you can get that. It's, it's just going to discourage them even to consider to come there. So I think uh, this ordinance is to some extent going to make it much more difficult for, for uh, landlords to bring uh, good tenants, and I, I, I don't know, I don't understand. If, if for example, let's say Apple Store wants to come to uh, San Carlos, is that going to be a problem? Is that going to be they need a to get block? a conditional use permit? But it, would it be granted, though? I think I, I just gave you an example yeah. from like at and store. They, they sell cell phones at seven hundred dollars a piece, and it's that's uh, like you look at the revenue that it generates from tax uh, is is just phenomenal. So, anyways, I think I, if if my comment is just like Vic said, you know, if something is not broken, why do you have to fix it? But I, I think if you have to do anything, there, it has to be very clear that what would the landlord expect to see from this process in terms of the approval? Is it a four-week process or is it a two-week process? Or maybe the landlord can come and say that this is the store that I want to bring. Can I get this approved? And to get some indication. Otherwise, it would be, at least for my location, it would be extremely difficult. at and lives. Uh, I have to bring some sort of a, a restaurant or any kind of other business will not survive there because I experienced that. So I think it is going to be something like a Verizon or, or AT&T or some, some, some sort of a destination business where people go there knowing that they have to go to a bank or cell phone store or whatever. It's not like they walk into a downtown to see which restaurant they have to go. Um, so that would be my comment. Thank you very much. Any other? Yeah, great. Thank you. Anyone else? Move to close the public hearing. Are we in a public hearing? I think we're in a public hearing, aren't we? Move to close the public hearing. Second. Can we get a roll call vote on that, please? Commissioner Harper Patterson? Yes. Commissioner Marsters? Yes. Commissioner Silberman? Yes. Vice Chair Bergman? Yes. And Chair Gutierrez? Yes. Okay, who wants to start? Well, I, I, well, I, I, I want a, I want a clarification, stuff. right? So what, there's, there's a temporary ordinance that's already been in place that was approved by City Council, right? And now what we're in the process of doing is defining the permanent zoning? Permit? Okay. I want to make sure I'm clear. All right. Thanks. Can you give us a quick reason or the history behind what triggered this? What triggered the whole um, the urgency ordinance? So the trigger in the community, uh, chairman and members of the uh, planning commission was, I believe it was the purchase of the uh, building in the 600 block um, on the uh, west side of um, Laurel Street where Miran Sheet is, Thrasher's bookstore. So there was a, there's a number of storefronts that were purchased by uh, a local uh, developer. And it had been in ownership for many, many years uh, by the same owner. Um, and so this new developer decided that, the, that um, he wanted to upgrade the facade and, and uh, the building itself and make improvements. Uh, this is John Bear, and this is just as he had done across the street with uh, Pete's Harvest and Patchy's. Um, so it was a big deal um, because essentially downtown is like everybody's living room, and so everybody knows what's going on. And, and it, uh, people in the community started to, I think, provide feedback to the city council. Uh, uh, Mayor Johnson uh, brought it up as an issue at, at the uh, council level, and, um, and that's how the urgency ordinance got started. So that's um, how it all began. So you're saying we can thank John is what you're saying. <laughs> Um, so I'll make a general observation, which is I don't like this ordinance at all. Um, but at the same time, is that general, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but at the same, well, no, I mean I, I generally dislike the ordinance. There are also specific things I dislike about the ordinance, and I'll get to those in a, in a second. Um, but I do feel that you know when the city council says they want something, um, it's our role to give them the best thing that we can give them that they've asked for. So I do feel like, despite the fact that I don't like the idea of this ordinance, uh, we have an obligation to present 
a recommendation to them of some kind. So um, I just wanted to put that out there. I can I can talk about some of the changes I'd suggest uh, whenever folks are ready. Um, well, I guess if we're talking general uh, feelings on the ordinance, um, just a couple of things strike me when when reading through it, and of course listening to public comment. I think number one is that you know I reiter I reiterate what uh, the business owners, at least in the public meetings, had said that formula businesses can often be, and in fact are, important um, parts of a vibrant downtown, and a lot of a lot of um, cases, it's the reason you go there. You go to the bank and then you stop at one or two other places. You go somewhere and then you stop at one or, one or other, one or two other pl places. Um, but uh, I think that, I don't know, I think the idea that the community should have no say in what goes in the core of downtown is, is maybe a bit of a, I don't know, a bit of a surprise actually that, that the community wouldn't have more of a say, quite frankly. The downtown core, while obviously the business owners own the buildings and um, it's it's a very important part of their financial, um, their personal financial viability, the downtown core, I think also impacts, directly impacts our quality of life and the values of our homes. So it's not, it doesn't seem like a stretch that we would have an additional layer of scrutiny in our downtown core. It doesn't. Um, CUPs are a pain. They were my very first foray over a decade ago into the planning world and not in a fun way, so I get that. Um, but it, it just seems that, you know, it seems like we should, we should have that layer of scrutiny in an area that is so important to the to the identity of our city. But are we talking, I mean, most of the things that they're talking about um, changing, it really has to do with design elements. So it's almost like you can split the, con the conditional use uh, apart from the design elements, not the way that the city council has recommended it, but is the concern really the conditional, the, the use, or is the concern of maintaining the, 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 the character and feeling of the downtown? And if there's a way to separate the two, we might be able to come up with something that's feasible. I mean, because then you wouldn't be, you know, restricting the, the business as much as you would be maintaining the, the character. You know what I'm saying? Well, you could do that, but see, I mean, the thing is, is that the purpose of the conditional use permit, uh, the rationale for it was to give the community an opportunity to uh, comment in a hearing. Like, we could put, uh -huh. we could put design requirements um, we could create design requirements where it was just a staff approval, but then there wouldn't be a mechanism for community comment. But I think the the issue here is not um, we're, we're we're coming at it from the opposite end. I think what the community was upset about is that they saw businesses that they like and enjoy that were thriving. Um, in jeopardy of leaving because somebody wanted to put something else in there. And so what we're, what we're doing here is we're essentially l trying to put conditions on what will go in there rather than trying to find ways to work with the land, the new landlord to say, these are businesses that the community would like to keep and how do we go about working with you to keep some of these businesses and so instead we're coming at it from the other end and saying okay we're now going to um, limit the limit what you really want to put in there instead of it just seems to me like instead of going and penalizing the the existing landlords and the new landlords that somewhere along the line we need to be working with them to say a lot of people really like this business how do we keep it and and so i'm just not sure that this ordinance does what I think the community really wanted it to do. Oh, I agree with the you. The ordinance on earth would do that. I, 
I mean, <laughs> there, there isn't one. No, I mean, I, I agree with you, Scott. I mean, that's where that's where I come from. But at the same time, there you you can't force a business to keep an, a tenant. Right. Uh, well, no, actually, no, strike that. There, there may be a way to do some sort of like. Uh, uh, re- 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 they're bad words. I'm not going to say them. Uh, but basically, rent stabilization, or uh, uh, or uh, you know, or relocation uh, stuff. There ought to be some attempt to work with a new landlord to keep an, an old tenant. At, you know, this just seems like it's very extreme for what was what the problem really is. I feel like we hear conditional use permits quite frequently. I guess I'm not, again, understanding that I've been on the other side of a conditional use permit and I do understand how frustrating it is. And I do understand that it also can um, deter potential tenants who just don't want to go through a CUP process. And I do think we need to have some more specificity around timing and streamlining of the process to make that as easy as possible. But having said that, we've we've approved many a CUP. I, I just don't think having a conditional use permit process is all that much of a hindrance. And this is coming from somebody that doesn't sure. like. Well, it's, it's it's like we don't have a choice on that. Right? We, don't have, we don't have a choice on whether we on the conditional use portion of it. But right, what, we're, what we have. Some say in what goes in it, but we don't really have a choice of whether or not uh, conditional use, that's, that this is the mechanism that's going to be put in place, right? If I'm understanding correctly what's in front of us. I mean, we can, we have some, we can decide. We, we, we can recommend to the city council that they not adopt an ordinance yeah, like this at all. Too. But I also think that we should try and improve this one so that if they decide they want to uh, adopt it, they can. Um, so... Should I make some suggestions? Can I ask? Can I, yeah, I, I'd like to ask some questions too. Um, so, can can staff give us a little direction or a little uh, information on what this timing process would be from an application for conditional use to approximately when planning or planning would be hearing that? I mean, to me, I think it's at least a couple month process. Am I wrong or? We estimate that we could process these um, between four to six weeks. I mean, that's our estimate for this type of, I mean, looking at the way the proposed ordinance language is drafted and based upon an item that will be presented to the commission so later this evening. That's tricky for a, uh, an owner of a building that either has signed a lease with someone um, or put language in that lease that is subject to a conditional use. Um, not to mention, some, I mean, we're hearing after this another, basically, uh, something on the emergency ordinance. I mean, how long did that process take, just as an example? Seven weeks. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, we had, we had about 10 days off or something like that. Okay, so, so it's in, in line with that four to six weeks. Along with that, what would the additional cost be to go through the conditional use process versus a normal application? What's the difference in cost for a business owner, for somebody that's trying to put a business in? Um, it said $6,000, right? Yeah, it's just under um, about $8,000. Eight, so this is an additional $8,000 expense for any business that's trying to get a formula business. A formula business to go into any um, location. So that's that's. I don't think the cost is a huge thing for a formula business. Well, you know, franchise that's just getting going, they just bought a franchise, $8,000 is pretty significant. That's fair. That's fair. So, yeah, that's that's one of the, I think, uh, I, I know that I, um, I agree that we hear conditional use permits all the time, um, but we're also talking about hearing a pretty concentrated potential conditional use permit, uh, you know, and, and four to six weeks on, a, on the actual processing of that time, say we have two or three or four at a time, 
given everything else that we're, we're hearing, I, I think four to six weeks is, isn't really that realistic when we start when this starts to get going. I think we're probably talking, you know, six to eight at the very minimal. So what happens in that time frame when a tenant, you know, wants to, a uh, landlord wants to lease this spot, um, you're either holding it or you're creating a lease that you're going to most likely break if it doesn't get approved. And so that's $8,000 that you'd pay for the conditional use permit. Potentially you have two months rent of a, a place or the landlord's out two months rent for the use of that building. Um, and I don't know what the cost of rent is in the buildings downtown, but I can't imagine that it's, it's uh, minimal. Um, so it just seems like this whole process is costing a lot of people a lot of money and a lot of time um, for what it was originally intended to do. Um, I, I, I well, a couple questions. Um, I guess for staff, um, how have some of the other, um, particularly California cities, dealt with this conundrum? Um, as far as timing and the business costs associated? I'll defer to Nell to see if, I don't know, I mean, I'm not sure if you've, if that was part of your research or you uncovered any information on that. I think it might be on. Yeah, we don't have, we didn't look at the cost in other cities. I guess that's a good point. Um, but I believe our fee schedule probably takes into account other cities and perhaps. So our fee schedule is based on, you know, staff time and, and other indicators. So um, unfortunately, we couldn't come up with a cost just for this type of CUP. Sort of have to treat all CUPs in the same way. And so that's why the cost would be the same as coming before the Planning Commission with, with any other CUP. Uh, if I could add, Mr. Chairman, yeah, so as Nell said, our, the cost of our CUP is in the market with other cities, so it's about the same as other cities in San Mateo County. Uh, and also the timing, actually we probably do better than most cities. Um, typically things take a little longer in other cities. Um, we, we pride ourselves on streamlining, so um, you know, it could take three months, four months. I mean, theoretically, it could take longer if it's a more complex situation. Um, with regard to the fees, the city council could, uh, in theory, establish a specific fee for this formula um, conditional use permit. So they could decide to adopt a specific fee or a reduced fee if, if they wanted to. Uh, another question, sorry, now you, you're up there and this might might be a better question for you. Have um, the other cities, uh, Los Gatos and Palo Alto popped to mind um, for the ones that you've noted. Um, when they implemented their, um, their ordinance, did they see a particular drop off in, um, in rental, rental rates or rental I don't, vacancy? I don't, I don't believe Palo Alto's has been used yet. Okay. Um, so it was sort of, in anticipation, um, Los Gatos is um, considering whether or not to suspend theirs for a right. period of time. That's exactly what I was. Yeah, right. so Los Gatos is really struggling with theirs yes. right now. Should they change the definition? They don't think their definition is specific enough. Um, I, you know, I think ours is a little bit more specific, and um, so yeah, they've. They've gone back and forth, and, and their economic development team and planning team and, and city council um, and various commissions are, are studying it right now, actually. So they're going through a similar process as we are. Thank you. That's exactly, um, I was thinking Los Gatos in particular, um, knowing that they've had, um, they've had a lot of, it's been in place for a number of years now, correct? And I know that they've, they've gone up and down with uh, their vacancy rates in their in their downtown core. Um, okay, David. Okay, so uh, as far as changes, starting um, with eighteen point two three um, and the necessary findings. Um, I struggle with the word compliments. Um, 
does that mean it has to improve? Uh, do we mean like not inconsistent with? Where did the word complement come from? Is that from another ordinance somewhere? Well, staff discussed this language <clears throat> as well. Um, you know, what was here before was the word compatible. Um, what we're really looking for is that the way that the use appears along the existing storefront uh, characteristics of the downtown area is done in a way that doesn't detract from or kind of stand out too much on its own. So, um, How about does not detract? Did you consider doing it that way? We could also look at it that way as well. Okay. Um, so anybody like does not detract better than compliment? Or is that, am I the only one who doesn't like compliment? Which one are you on again? I'm on C1A. C1A, okay. I'm, I'm fine with, I'm fine with oh, that's yeah. not detract, okay. yeah. And then um, <laughs> unique small town character. Does Do we actually think San Carlos has a unique small town character? Is it even a small town? Are we a small town? It, it, I that, don't mind taking small that town was out. part of the general plan, keeping the village character of San Carlos and the small town feel of San Carlos. Small town to, in the middle of, uh, of uh, Silicon Valley. Com compared to, um, yes, a lot of compared to what? <laughs> downtown Redwood City, um, San Mateo, Redwood down, City. downtown San Mateo. It's a small town compared to them. So, okay. It was part All right. Of, part of I'll, the, I'll leave it alone. The general plan. Um, and then, as far as C is concerned, um, we already talked about balance. We're changing that to uh, mixture. Mix. Is that right? Mix. Or Mix. mixture. Yeah. Mixture. Mixture blend. Yeah. And then in B, we're taking out the word um, vacancy. Is that right? Rates. We were taking out rates. Rates. Oh, rates. Um, I have a question on the, the term economic health. Um, what if something like a YMCA wanted to, I mean, they would necessarily add to the economic health of the, but that would be providing a service to the community. We do want it, is it, if it has to, we have to find all three of these. Do we want, do we want to have to say that? But the zoning would already take care of not having a what? YMCA. Yeah, okay. why wouldn't right. it fall under the zoning? Right. Um. Does anyone have any other changes to 18.23? I guess um, no, but one of the questions that I would ask is can we put in a time limit? Yeah. I, okay, I we, I so can yeah. we say 30 days from the time the permit is, and, and I know that is a crunch for staff, but it's, it's also trying to balance um, the, property rights. The, the, the owners and the applicants with um, well that would fit nicely in in B I mean could we add um, and uh, and brought to the planning commission for approval within six weeks and less infeasible Staff would like to reply to that, if I may. All right. I can just tell you here. Um, when we schedule projects for review and consideration by the decision-making body, such as a planning commission, we work with the applicants uh, very hard to make sure that their application is complete. Sometimes we receive applications that you know don't have all the necessary information, or perhaps aren't describing materials, or perhaps they have submitted something does, that doesn't comply with the code. Let's just use sign area, for example. So we'll work with them, let them know that you know they need to make a modification or update their plan sheet so that the correct sheets that, that propose something that complies. I can so, fix that. So yeah. how about okay. a, and, and brought to the Planning Commission uh, within four weeks of being deemed complete by planning staff yes. uh, and less infeasible? That's fine. I, I, can I just say something on this one? I, I have one concern about talking about the timing of, of uh, 
bringing use permits. It's not related to staff resources necessarily, but what, if you change it here, you're giving a precedent, or I mean, a pre precedence to formula business use permits over all other use permits, because those are the ones that are gonna have to move forward first because you you would have put a time limit on it. I guess the infeasibility creates a little out, but um, that creates an expectation, I think, in the code that that's the default. You will move to the Planning Commission within four weeks. And the second is, I think probably more important, um, is that we didn't notice this for for a change in the, the, that would encompass changing the timing for processing use permits. So I have a concern there that adding it just to this ordinance without looking at it comprehensively might create a, an issue for uh, noticing in the Brown Act. So um, I'd recommend that if you want to give direction to us to look at how use permits are processed, that we could bring that back to you. And that could include these types of use permits. But I, I have a concern that, that uh, we, we might be running afoul of um, the noticing provisions. Even, even though we're just providing a recommendation to the City Council? It's still, the same rules still apply to us at, at the Planning Commission level, um, even though, yeah, technically it's just a recommendation. You're not the final decision-making body, but you are a recommending body. You are participating in the decision, and we haven't noticed that we might be changing the time requirements for processing of a use permit. Okay. So can we add that as a second, as a recommendation, a separate recommendation? Um, that the city that the city council consider um, or look at um, uh, the timing of the um, applications and and thereby sort of without putting an actual number in there. Yeah, I, I think the same. You could do that. I don't think you could do that tonight. I think okay. you just have to. You you would have to. Um, Talk you, about you'd have to ask the council and the let the council know that that there was a without a consensus there was a concern yeah. expressed you can, about you timing. You can, so that the records here were on tape and the and the uh, and the uh, individual planning commissioners could could certainly make their concerns known to the council. Can I interject a second? Because um, I know we're we're looking at. Um, specific changes and then Greg you just mentioned the timing is there a, do we need to hurry this along I mean is there a timing imperative here for making a decision on this and the only reason I ask is that now your your response um, about Los Gatos triggered something for me and now I will immediately go and research the, or, <laughs> the, this is the ordinance Gatos. expires on April 13th okay, so we have some urgency then to to make a decision tonight. I think this is the last meeting that we could possibly decide anything um, and the City Council would still have an opportunity to speak to the issue and then a uh, second question then although they could extend it I guess another uh, another 14 months if they wanted or 18 months how long can they extend it for if they want to you could extend up to two years on an urgency ordinance, but we th this one, the policy direction given by the council was we want certainty. We don't want it to, to extend out. And I imagine landlords want certainty too. I, I mean, it makes sense. I, I'm not asking to belabor it, but it also does seem just based on the very brief conversation we've had so far that most of you are not in favor of it. I might be the only one that's leaning towards yes here, and even I'm, and even I have my reservations. So I guess that's my concern about forcing the vote and forcing the issue. I, I'd rather get it right than get it fast. I guess is my comment. So, where does that leave us? <laughs> yeah, where does that leave us? We suggest that you move forward this evening and, you know, if you have other questions or other specific details that you want to add to this, we'd be happy to uh, try and work with you on that. But we, you know, this, we'd have to extend the urgency ordinance again and, um, I mean, that theoretically that could be the case or, I mean, the planning commission should vote the way the planning commission wants to vote. That's the other thing. I mean, you can, I think you've made some very good suggestions and changes to this ordinance and had a really good discussion, but um, your vote is your vote. 
so we can still bring whatever you come up with to the city council um, with your vote. Okay. So uh, before I move on to uh, 18.41, did anyone have any other suggested changes to 18.23? Well, we if we vote, if we, what happens if we were to vote against this, right? If, we, if, what would, I mean, because we basically have a mandate to vote for something, but what happens if we vote against it? Then what happens? Is, they still take it to the city council. City council so, so yeah. they, they do what they're going to do regardless of our input. Well, hopefully exactly. they'll take some of the. Input. Hopefully they'll take our input also. So the changes that we're discussing and that David specifically is bringing up. Um, hopefully will be considered and what they ultimately vote on, even if we vote against it and they vote for it. Am I yeah, reasoning that correctly? Well okay. I just don't think we figured out how to, I, I, I just don't think we figured out the part about how to, to, to um, help the, the landlords yet. That's the thing that's a lot standing is that they have, that's one thing that was consistent with everyone out there. And I don't think we've solved that yet. I, don't have, I, I think that. Scott's last suggestion about at least having staff and city council look into whether we can expedite um, the CEP process is probably the biggest suggestion that would help that at this point, at least. Yeah, um, but then we're, we're, we're biasing. In doing Indeed, so, we are we biasing are. one over the other, and I don't, yeah. like, I don't like that either. That is a straight up fact. So That's why I'm not comfortable with that whole yeah. So, so I have really three issues um, with this. One is globally, I think we're coming at this from the wrong way. Instead of um, trying to find a way to um, look at um, a, a change of ownership in a property and and look at somehow working with a new owner. So that's that's sort of globally, because that's what's driving this process. It's not the people who already own the property that already have businesses there. It's, it's somebody buys a property and now they remove all the tenants. And I'm not, I'm not saying that you don't get to remove tenants. I'm saying that somehow there needs to be a way to work with a new a property owner um, for what the do you suggest? Tenants. I I don't know. I'm, well, I'm I well I don't know either. I mean that's yeah. the thing is so that's the, but, but I, I can identify like, problems too, but unless we have right. a solution but, for but it, this this doesn't seem to be solving that problem. Agreed. Okay, so we're putting something in place that's not really going to solve the problem. Agreed. Instead, yeah. we're just putting something in place agree and, and that's the problem that I have because it agreed. doesn't solve the problem yes yeah, I agree okay okay and so the second thing the two things that I do have a, when I say okay I've got to look at this um, the two things I have problems with is the timing so I need to know it's it's going to be quick for the new businesses coming in and the cost has to be reasonable because when I look at a an eight thousand dollar cost for a business to go through this, whereas three months ago they didn't have to go. That it, to me feels like we're going to not have a lot of businesses come into the city. Okay. So, anybody else have anything on eighteen point two three? No, nothing's specific. I think we can move on to okay. Um, so eighteen point four one. So if the primary concern was like really big chain stores, um, I, I know that ten is arbitrary, and any other number I come up with is always are also going to be arbitrary. But I'm thinking maybe a, a higher number. Um, you know, I don't know whether it's 25 or 40 or 50. Um, uh, I mean, 10 can still be a family business. I mean, I don't, I don't know that the intention was to affect family businesses. It's the idea that if it's a, it's a, if it's a much higher number, the example that was used in public uh, comment, the Apple store, it would clearly not bother them anyway. And the idea is that Apple would be such a long-lasting tenant then it wouldn't matter. 
Is that kind of the idea of raising the can I, can I suggest that we look at public versus private? What do you mean by that? I mean, that a, a publicly company traded company versus, versus a privately, privately held company. company. I, I mean, that doesn't. And some other just, legal issues ooh, there. That, yeah, well, and like in and out, I think is privately held, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Um, I just threw that out as an idea. Try to mix things up here. Huh? I mean, I'm just, <laughs> you, you know, and keep in mind, I'm coming at this for, as a person who isn't in favor of this ordinance. So by increasing the number, I I decrease its applicability. Um, so. Um, May I um, kind of share uh, as part of our discussion uh, with the chair and commission? So we had this discussion about how to benchmark this number. And the difficulty, and we thought about, yeah, well, maybe it should be higher. And, you know, if so, what should that number be? And when we really drilled down on it and, and talked with Greg about the legal ramifications of coming up with a number larger than 10, it became, we believe, arbitrary at that point. And so that is going to be the difficulty and, um, and, Maybe the attorneys in the arbitrary because other people use ten. <laughs> well, you're, you're benchmarking into other cities that have <laughs> tested it in court as well, and so we we had a we had difficulty just coming up with a number like twenty or thirty or forty, and so we stuck with the number ten because we think that's the the best thing to do from a regulatory standpoint. But we, wait, the commission it, could certainly recommend something else. And just, just to underline that point, we did, we did actually review all the other ordinances to determine some commonality. And from a policy standpoint, it seemed like 10 was a, a reasonable number because the purpose of the ordinance is to um, provide a layer of regulation over formula businesses, and if you make the number too high, then it starts to defeat the purpose of this additional regulation of businesses that the public might perceive as formula businesses that should have been regulated as opposed to businesses that are small enough that, and it's a, it's a matter of opinion, I, I agree, um, and I think there is some flexibility in the number. I'm not saying that there isn't. It's just where do you draw the line? It's always that in this situation. What is the highest number you saw? I think 11 was the highest number we saw. I saw 12 in the city comparisons <laughs> that <laughs> now gave us. 12 somewhere. <laughs> well, there was a, up to 11, and the 12th one triggered the, the I think that was San Francisco's <laughs> ordinance. Okay. I mean, is there a city that actually this is working well for? The, the, I mean, we've, we've had two that we're not sure it's working well for. Is there one that there's like good feedback for that we would consider a good benchmark in the, the way that they've done it? Is there... I think that's for now to answer. I guess it depends what what you would consider good. I mean, th we looked at cities that have denied conditional use uh, permit applications, just as sort of like what happens when one is denied. Um, and you know, Sausalito a few years ago denied a subway. The Planning Commission denied a subway restaurant, and it was appealed to the City Council, and the City Council upheld, um, upheld the Planning Commission's decision to deny the proposal. Um, and, you know, so it worked in that regard, um, but then again, cities allow them all of the time. So you consider San Francisco's process, um, it's quite onerous, and they deny uh, applications frequently. They have numerical benchmarks for how much is allowed in certain areas, um, and they have very strict findings. Um, but they, there is also a significant amount of formula retail in neighborhoods throughout San Francisco. So it does happen, and the process does work, and, and theirs are, is super lengthy, um, closer to you know six months to a year. I guess what I'm going on is, 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 do we have an example where it's, where it's been implemented and business is still thriving and that it hasn't become a chokehold on business. I guess if I'm I, I would say Sausalito, they've had theirs for a number of years and I would consider downtown Sausalito to be quite nice and thriving and um, I mean San Francisco is a hard point of comparison. Um, but I don't know. Benicia? How closely does ours mirror Sausalito's um, ordinance? Let me take a look at Sorry, it. I'm looking I am looking at the findings and they seem but obviously, it's not the whole. Well, 
We could always come back this, to oh, this team in a couple minutes. Yeah. Um, so then also going back to 18.41.020, um, the way I read it now, even with the and, is that it still probably wouldn't apply to most family businesses because of the word required. I mean, it says required by contractual or other arrangement. I mean, I asked um, staff, and they indicated, well, if they, you know, if they have the same, you know, decor and color schemes and trademark, um, then they would be a formula business. But they're not required to do that. They just choose to do that because it's good business for them. So, I'm actually less concerned about family businesses if that's actually everybody else's interpretation or if we could actually firm that by you know maybe adding the word legal in front of arrangement um, where it's basically it's a franchise or a contract situation and not simply because it, it in some ways this becomes moot if it applies to any business that has ten or more and has a trademark any business that uses the same name has a trademark um, so that's going to be every business, and like all of, and everything else is basically superfluous. So um, I guess I, I'm kind of curious as to the rest of the commission's interpretation, and I guess the city attorney's interpretation as well, as to whether or not if you, you know, if you if you have a dry cleaner and you've got ten dry cleaners and they're all called Dynasty, um, but it's not a franchise and you own them all. And you have, you know, you trademarked the word dynasty. Are you a formula business under this ordinance? Well, I think that was, um, as Nell stated earlier, that was the language of the other arrangements. And I took a look during the, after you brought up this issue, which is a good one, uh, the, uh, the other ordinances that we reviewed to, to generate this language. This is the exact language that's in the urgency ordinance. It's also the exact language that the city of Palo Alto used for um, their California Avenue um, retail area. Um, we This issue didn't come up in our discussions about the, the ambiguity of, of using that language. Um, so it's really a matter of policy direction and intent. Do, do we want to encompass businesses that aren't, that are not franchises because that's the contractual relationship. My concern is that the the, the uh, there are like, there is a category, and you mentioned one of one such business, In and Out Burger, that has all the characteristics of a formula business, but it's owned by one family um, or or a corporation controlled by one family. So I think the intent was to encompass those types of businesses as well, and that's why we can. And I think that's probably why Palo Alto came up with this other arrangements language. And we could be more specific. And I thought of a few things that I'll just throw out there, and you can consider it. Um, if we don't want to use other arrangements because we think that's vague, we could say by by contract, business model, or practice, we could we could come up with some language that. Instead of saying other arrangements, we we talk about um, that because uh, that business model and practice would cover the other types of businesses that I was describing, and I think that was our intention, um, and 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 I think that's the city council's intention, frankly, in um, in adopting the language that's in the urgency ordinance. But there are this is the line I think the line drawing that you were talking about before, um, Commissioner Silverman that. There are if people have a different opinion as to what constitutes a family business and what, what where you go into more of a formula business, because you could have a formula business that meets all the other requirements, but there's five of them, uh, and you know there used to be a burger chain around here called Pudleys. At one point, there were five or six of them on the peninsula, and they were th the same. <laughs> you went, their menus were the same. They had the same name. They kind of have the same look and feel, their locations might have been different. They didn't quite make it to 10, but if they had 20 such businesses, you might say, you yeah, know, you're kind of a formula business. So it is a line drawing. I think now that's we have like Rangoon Ruby, right? You know, now they've got what, they've got four different restaurants, although a couple of them have different names. They have a very similar menu. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if they hit up to 10, I guess they would be a formula business too. And then you know, we have another successful, not to pick on certain restaurants that are successful, but the Refuge has another location now in Menlo Park and 
we could all envision them being a successful regional business that has a similar model. But I, so that's where the line drawing is, I think. If, if, if you think 10's too low, then I think you should propose a different number to the city council, then let the city council consider that. Um, and if you want to be more specific, I just threw out that by contract, business model, or practice. And then you could take one of those words out maybe or something, but um, I think uh, that that would address at least the, the perceived ambiguity for with other arrangements. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't, I don't like it, but at the same time, I don't like ambiguity either. So um, I actually would um, suggest that change as recommended by the city attorney. Um, but I would eliminate um, I would eliminate the inclusion of trademark or service mark because I think that that basically captures everything. Um, because there's no business that basically every business is going to have a, a trademark or service mark of their name. I'd agree with that. Um, so I would I would ask to remove those. You could say the same thing for color scheme signs. See, those are the things that the city's worried about, right? Is someone coming, like you know, someone putting a giant in and out sign, um, you know, in the middle of, of Laurel Street, right? I mean, I, don't know the I mean, that's as you get to ten businesses. Those are the things that you know you can save money on. Those are the. I mean, um, even for a family-owned business, if you keep things similar, you can buy in bulk. You can make it cheaper. That's why you're successful. Uh, right. But the one thing that that came across in in all of the public feedback was that really the signage and the exterior part was the part they agreed everybody should adhere to what the downtown so we character that. looks like. So, do yeah, that. I mean. We can do that through a sign. Through design, yeah. Yeah. design right. guidelines. Yeah. We don't have to. Perhaps, exactly. We, we can do that for design, a, through design a, review or the sign to, ordinance. To, to take care of that. So that's what I'm. So you're saying we should just maybe strengthen the language in a sign ordinance or maybe not maybe we don't even need to if it if it were me and it would just me voting <laughs> i would vote hear this i would vote no and I, I i am probably going to vote no simply because i this is solving is not solving the original problem Okay, it's penalizing all of the existing l landlords in the downtown because we have one landlord that is now doing things that people don't like. And it just seems to me like we're penalizing a whole bunch of people because one person is doing something we don't like. And I just, and so this doesn't solve that at all. Yeah. So I, it, it just to me it doesn't make any sense to do it's not that i disagree with you scott and i understand I. that I, I just on the other hand I. I feel like many of our residential codes restrictions or whatever punish some of us because of something somebody else did you know what i'm saying i mean yeah i don't get to build a colonial because somebody decided that you know we needed certain setbacks on our top floor i mean <laughs> And so I'll end up getting a craftsman like everybody else. But <laughs> my point is, like, we're, you know what I'm saying? There's, that's a part of being part of a community. I mean, yeah, it, it does suck and it is a hindrance. And many of our other businesses have had to apply for conditional use permits already. But, and again, I have my reservations. I think I've made that clear. Um, but to say that we don't have a say in our downtown is quite frankly. And Scott, we can have a motion that says we recommend not adopting an ordinance, but if you do adopt the ordinance as we've recommended it be changed. I mean, that's kind of what I was yeah. foreseeing doing. I, 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 I can live with that. I just, um, It seems like we're trying to do something that doesn't solve the original problem, and and I, that's that's what bothers me is we're putting more regulations in place that don't that don't solve why this was brought forward in the first place. Yeah, that's right. Although the city council wanted it. Oh, I know. 
So, David, do you have anything else? Uh, yeah, I, I think well, adopting the um, the recommendation of the city attorney on the on the modification to arrangement, um, uh, eliminating trademark or service mark, and changing ten to fifteen, and adding the word "and." Those would be my suggestions. Okay. I hate to go back, <laughs> but I'm having a little bit of a problem. Um, again, kind of going back to the scenario that we, we talked about, I'm going to use Mr. Girdlestone's, uh, Girdlestone's uh, um, building as an example, just because I know what the location of it is and, and who the tenants are. But the way it's worded, say his, the, the tenant that's a Hallmark store Say they decide to move over one space or two spaces over. I mean, it would trigger it. it yeah, trigger absolutely. It yes. Yeah. And, and I kind of have a big problem with that. Even, even if uh, they wanted to expand by ten percent into one of his uh, one of his other um, uh, spots, that would also trigger it. Yeah, I, I have a pro I have a problem with that because again, I don't think it. it uh, going back to the mix scenario, it doesn't change the mix. Yeah. I mean, we could. Yeah. I mean, we could we could uh, put an exception in it for uh, businesses moving, you know, within a block of each other. I suppose, right? Recommend the exception. Yeah, I I think the. Um, I think I see a couple problems with that just because use permits run with the land. I mean, they're supposed to be with the site. Um, and so what you're talking about is, is another layer of exceptions from the regulatory scheme as opposed to a transferability, which you can't do because it's a use permit. Does that permit. mean that if it runs with the land, once there's a conditional use permit at a location for a formula business, then... Uh, it can sell that conditional use permit to another formula business? As, as, long as, as long as it's, as I understand from staff, as long as it's a similar business. So if it was, uh, if they're, I don't even, you know, American Greetings has a store. If they came in and we use Hallmark, the Hallmark store as an example, some other similar use could and, go in. And the use permit set as far as the use, okay. Narrow, right? Like they couldn't have been unoccupied for a certain amount of time. Mm-hmm. And would that still apply? So all of the businesses now that don't need CUPs, they would, of course, be grandfathered in. Um, does that mean that if a new business went in that was of a similar or identical use, even if they're a formula business, would it trigger a CUP if it went in right away? I think the first time they, they would have to, even though Got it. the prior okay. business might have been grandfathered. So nobody else is having a problem with that. <laughs> it's just me. No, I have a problem with it. It just doesn't sound like we can fix it. Well, this is fun. Yeah. Good times. Anybody have any other problems we can't fix that yeah. they want to bring up? <laughs> so, so many. Yeah. Related to this, because otherwise it would violate the Brown Act. <laughs> we can't fix the timing or the cost. And that seems to be one of the biggest, or two of the biggest concerns, yeah. And I would echo those concerns. All right, fun. Okay, I, I can make a motion. Uh, let's do it. I guess. <laughs> let's do it. Okay. Well, right before we make the motion, like I said, I I think I know where you guys are going to vote. I'm going to vote in the affirmative, not because I don't have reservations, but because I think the idea of having a say in our downtown core is important. So. I'm not, go. gonna, I'm not going to let you do that because the way I'm going to to frame the motion, you're, you're going to have to vote no, which is going to be extremely okay. ambiguous. All right, then. So um, I move that the Planning Commission adopt a resolution recommending that the City Council not adopt an ordinance, introduce an ordinance uh, to amend Chapters 18.05, 18.23, 
and 18.41 of the San Carlos Zoning Ordinance, Title 18 of the San Carlos Municipal Code to define formula businesses and establish a permit process for formula businesses uses in the downtown core area. However, in the event that the City Council does opt to introduce an ordinance to amend chapters 18.05, 18.23 and 18.41 of the San Carlos Zoning Ordinance, Title 18 of the San Carlos Municipal Code to define formula businesses and establish a permit process for formula business uses in the downtown core area. Uh, the Planning Commission recommends that it introduce an ordinance like that presented to the Planning Commission uh, at uh, tonight's meeting with the uh, changes that have been discussed on the record. Will that work? So that's my motion. He's not I'll second it. I was going to say he's not going to amend his motion, so. <laughs> All right. Discussion? Any more? Just want to check here. So if we vote yes, we're saying no, they shouldn't approve this ordinance. We're saying no, they shouldn't approve the ordinance, but if they do, if they, do. they should I, approve yeah, it I with just, the changes we've recommended. I just, just want to make sure and, uh, because she, the, the way you were doing Okay. I like the way you did that, David, actually. That's pretty brilliant. It was just to thwart. <laughs> just to mess, uh, it was just, just to, it was, it was, it was to just thwart Angela and no other reason. All right. Fair enough. All right. Seconded. So, can I have a roll call vote then? Commissioner Harper Pedersen. No. Commissioner Marsters? Yes. Commissioner Silverman? Yes. Vice Chair Bergman? Yes. And Chair Gutierrez? Yes. Okay, moving along. <clears throat> Item C, 864 Laurel Street, Suite 200, APN 050-163-270, consideration of a request for conditional use permit to allow a formula business travel agency on the 800 block of Laurel Street within the downtown core and review of, of a new wall sign. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Laura Russell with the, with the Planning Division. So the item before you is a request for a conditional use permit to operate a travel agency that is subject to the Formula Business Urgency Ordinance. And this request also includes a new wall sign. The project site is located at 864 Laurel Street, Suite 200, which is on the west side of the street. The site is zoned MUDC, Mixed Use Downtown Core. The general plan land use designation is Mixed Use Medium Density. The lot is 7,750 square feet, and there's one building on site that currently has three commercial spaces. It includes nothing but cakes, Planet Halo, and the subject site, which is 920 square feet. There are two existing residential units above and eight parking spaces on site. As you are aware, the city council passed an urgency ordinance, and I just want to make the one point that it, it put in place interim zoning. It did not establish a moratorium. So it is within the applicant's right to apply for this conditional use permit, which they have applied for for your consideration this evening. So you're aware of why we're doing this and why we're here tonight. The one other point I wanted to make is that the applicant had originally reviewed her proposed business with staff prior to the passage of the urgency ordinance, but her formal application for that business was received after the urgency ordinance was adopted, so it does apply to her. So she did not have knowledge that it would apply at the time that she originally was considering this site. Um, also, since the city is considering the urgency ordinance at this time, um, we have used the community development discretion, a director's discretion, to elevate the sign permit application up to your level for concurrent review. So that's why the sign permit is um, with your, with the conditional use permit tonight. 
So this proposed use is considered walk-in clientele, which is an office use which is permitted within this district. Um, it's a formula business for the reasons that we've discussed this evening. This um, specific business is independently owned. It's a franchise. It's Expedia Cruise Ship Centers. This would be a full-service travel agency specializing in cruise vacations. There are 34 locations within the United States. Four of those are in California, and the closest is in Petaluma. So based on the market territory, the way that these franchise um, is organized, the business would be the only franchise that could operate in the immediate area of San Carlos, Belmont, Redwood Shores, and Redwood City. The um, owner of the business plans on hiring about 20 vacation consultants, is how it works within their business model. And the vacation consultants would be independent contractors who largely work from home. They may work from this subject site, but no more than five would be present at any time. The applicant is proposing minor interior tenant improvements to open up the space and create the work areas. The hours of operation would be from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Saturday, with extended hours to 8 p.m. on Thursdays. Those Thursday hours would be to ac um, accommodate two different types of small events that they may have um, to advertise the different types of tours and um, travel that they would offer or to have the vacation consultants um, come and learn about that particular type of job opportunity. There are currently eight parking spaces on site, like I mentioned, six for the commercial uses and two for the residential uses. But as you're aware, um, the walk-in clientele office use less than 1,500 square feet does not require any parking at this location. So all of that to say that the existing parking condition would remain and it doesn't require any other type of entitlement related to parking. And then moving on to the proposed sign, um, as shown here, the applicant is proposing a new wall sign with channel letters. The sign reads Expedia Cruise Ship Centered, it's red, white, and blue, and includes the logo of a cruise ship. The total square footage of the proposed sign is 18.39 square feet, um, quite a bit less than the maximum of 30 square feet that could be allowed. The criteria for approval of signs is included in your staff report on page 5, and staff does find that the width of the sign is in proportion to the front facade, and channel letters are also used on a number of businesses around downtown and would fit in with that, including the two immediately adjacent businesses, which are Starbucks and Nothing Bunt Cakes. So we do find that it would be complementary and fitting to the other signs in the area. This proposed, I mean, this facade is set back a little bit, um, as you're probably aware from the street frontage, so we wouldn't um, anticipate any effect on driver or pedestrian safety, which is also one of the criteria that's listed. The applicant has also proposed window signage, um, but we are not able to recommend approval for that at this time because it didn't um, comply with the maximum. So if they do want to pursue that window signage, we've added a condition of approval that would require the applicant to come back to the Planning Commission um, free of charge. It would be included in the cost that they've already paid so that the Planning Commission could approve that window signage. So staff finds that the proposal meets the required um, findings for approval. It complies with several of the general plan policies, such as maintaining a mixture of businesses in the downtown and supporting businesses that serve city residents as well as visitors. And although it is a formula business, the owner lives locally, independently owns the franchise, and the limitations of the franchise agreement ensure that no additional Expedia cruise ship centers would be allowed to locate um, in San Carlos or neighboring cities. Any future signage or exterior changes would require review by the Planning Commission to ensure that the business would fit in in the downtown, as well as the operating hours, which are consistent with other businesses in the downtown area. The proposed wall sign also meets the criteria for approval and would blend in with other um, downtown signs. Staff has not received any comments um, on the use permit or the sign application in response to our notice. Um, this is a motion that you would make if you would choose to approve this application. Um, two things were left for you um, and are available for the public, um, and those were just to correct minor mistakes um, in putting out that staff report. So a revised draft conditional use permit with the correct corporation name has been um, left for you. So that would be um, the formal motion language is the one that's on your screen or in the revised one that was given to you, just taking out that old language. 
So I'm available for any questions that you might have, and the applicant has been um, here this evening, and I'm sure would be happy to answer any questions <laughs> that you might have um, on her request. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions for staff right now? Um, why doesn't the conditional use permit have the employee limitations or the hours limitations? Is that not something that would normally be in there? Um, it often would be, and we would be happy to include it um, in this case. It is often included for conditional use permit applications. Okay, so was that, was that an intentional omission or an unintentional omission? I would anticipate it was an unintentional omission. Okay. All right. I, I, I think, honestly, it's a, um, the first conditional use permit for a formula business um, that staff had processed, and we were thinking about it at the same time as the ordinance. And so we, I think it would be an improvement to the certificate to add those items. Okay. Real quick question. Is there a bathroom? There's a shared bathroom in that building. There's two bathrooms in that building. Shared bathroom. So there's, okay. Uh, it just 15 years ago I was in that building, so I'm okay. quite familiar with it. it. It just seems to me like one of the ways we get around the 1500 is these little things like shared bathrooms, hallways, and, and not that I, it's nothing against this business. It's the same issue we were dealing with with the property on, um, El Camino is mm -hmm. is this one actually has parking though. <laughs> <laughs> this one has parking. It doesn't have to have parking. Um, I gotta say this so is one of the this probably did this because it was built the, for the inter most interesting, interesting building that you'll see from a design perspective. Uh, absolutely, it yeah, used to be so a liquor store back in the day. So yeah, um, uh, that was my only question. I I just I didn't see it on the plans, and I um, thought that that needed to be cleared up. Um, as far as um, the findings that we don't have to make because the ordinance doesn't exist yet, um, do we know anything about uh, uh, vacancy or unmet needs? I mean, how, how long has the space been uh, unlet? Do we know? I think it was in one of the reports. I think it's, it's November or? Less than September. And then in regards to the unmet needs, there's not another travel agency in the downtown core area. I, I have a question um, about the, the lighting. Um, it, how bright is the LED lighting for the sign? Um, I don't know the specifics. It has to meet always um, the building code energy efficiency requirements. Um, so it, that's always kind of the maximum in that case. Right. Um, I guess just given the uh, given the hours, it seems surprising that the sign would be lit at all, given that it's going to only operate till six. I and nothing bunt cakes right next to it doesn't have a lighted sign, so I guess I'm I'm sort of also thinking if it if it's this big bright <laughs> lighted sign right there, it just doesn't seem like it would the signage would fit in all that well. Yeah. Except that in the winter when it gets dark at four well, um, five, and, and people are looking to get away and take cruises and okay. things like that, it right. may, I can come, be may come in handy. I can be convinced. I think we're good right now for staff. Did the applicant want to? He waited patiently. <laughs> and thank you for waiting. And it's ironic that we heard that other thing uh, before hearing this one. So. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Grace Lau. Um, I'm the owner of the franchised uh, Expedia Cruise Ship Centers business. And um, I can answer that question in terms of the uh, sign um, lighting. Well, sort of answer it. Actually, Nothing Bunt Cakes does have a lighted sign. It's on the side of it's their the building. Side of the building yeah, the instead yeah. of the awning. Oh. Um, and uh, so my lights would be basically controlled um, with a light sensor. So based on when it gets dark, it would actually turn on. Um, and the reason why we do want a lighted sign is because um, of those evening events that we d we plan on having um, on Thursday evenings in, in sort of in, in conjunction with hot harvest nights and whatnot. So we, we'd like to have, um, you know, since we're going to be open till 8 p.m. Uh, for those types of events, we'd like to make sure that we have that available. 
So um, a, cu a couple of questions you for you, if you don't helps. mind. So yeah, that was one of my questions on your Thursday evenings. And are you aware that they're talking about moving hot harvest harvest nights to on a to a Sunday? Ah, well, it, we wanted to just choose one particular night okay. um, of the week for for the community to be able to gather for that of so, our events. And, so, I, if I remember correctly, that has that that open area too. Is that is that part of your lease there? Yes. And is that where you would be holding? No, it would be inside. inside. Okay. So our desks would be actually able to um, kind of reconfigure and and they're mobile, so that we can we do, we will have a screen a TV screen inside where we would do presentations and whatnot. Okay, so that that'll be where your cruise night uh, cruise nights and then your uh, hosting. Um, for potential people that are going to be working for you. Right. Okay. So we would be basically inviting uh, cruise professionals uh, from the different cruise lines or other um, vacation suppliers, and they would be coming in and helping us to explain more about the product or, you know, introducing cruising to um you know, customers have never done it before. There's a lot of questions that people have about that. So we have those type of events and um, obviously promotional type events that we would also be discussing at that time. Uh, those discovery nights are, you know, to you know regularly have an opportunity for uh, people in the community to learn about our opportunity and um, ask questions, uh, you know, in, more informally before, you know, kind of going through an interview process. So that's a, another opportunity as well. That was my only questions. Anyone else have any questions? Um, and the restrooms are um, actually in the building site plan. If it's uh, it's behind the yellow section, if you can see it. And those are all so all three businesses there sure. share. Yes, okay. it's a it's a locked restroom um, that all three businesses share. Or two I, two restrooms, male and female. Just get concerned when I see areas that or businesses and they don't and they have plans but they don't have a bathroom, mm -hmm. and it usually in some cases means that the one we did with on El Camino, they were trying to figure out how to split something but only had a bathroom for one of the two businesses, and, well, and that was something they completely were trying, different. Yeah, but they were trying to get around the <laughs> they park. They were trying to get around something that that was a, so. All I know is I'm not responsible for cleaning it. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's always good. Yeah. It's the important part. Um, so just sort of to add uh, that I, I am the first business to sort of be caught by this uh, conditional use permit. Um, the date of my application was actually a little bit later than I would have actually applied because I had follow-up questions. The, the timing was that I had originally um, asked the uh, the planning commission, uh, planning department, um, about my, you know, if it was a restricted use or anything like that uh, for this particular lease location, and um, I was given the okay to move ahead, and that was in October 23rd. Um, I've then proceeded down signing the lease, um, and that was executed on December 8th, and then I just found out about this. <laughs> so then that's when. I went back to planning. I was like, I don't understand what this means. So there was a lot of questions, and I think there were still clarifications by the planning department. So that, you know, in the end, like I couldn't be grandfathered <laughs> back yeah. to the original decision until, and it would, everything depended on when I actually filed. And that's when I, I just went ahead and filed um, the business registration. So it was kind of a weird process because of the way things went down. <laughs> Sounds like a word process, yeah. yeah. So and the only reason that you selected Thursday to be your late night was because of hot harvest nights? Um, it was also one of the nights that seems to have worked well with some of the other um, franchise partners in, in other areas. So Okay. Do you, do you want to give her the flexibility? I was to thinking about one? that. Yeah. yeah, I was thinking oh, about that. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it, flexibility, that might yeah, you don't want to be locked. Yeah, in I mean, I was thinking maybe just change it to, you know, may stay Are open we? one night uh, per week till 8 p.m. Yes. Um, that but, would be great. great. Yeah. <laughs> probably enough. not on the weekend, um, but it would probably be well, we either a Wednesday it, or Thursday, if anything. We'll just we'll give you the flexibility, I think, of, of picking the day. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep. Sounds good. And, mm -hmm. and so the other question is, if Hot Harvest Nights is going to be Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, 
Is that has that been decided? Well, no Sunday matter what, morning. they have nine a.m. Uh, yeah, in the morning. In the yeah. morning, Sunday morning. Is it every? Is it once a month or it's gonna, um, every week? Well, they're talking about going to year round. So year round. that's the intent of the chamber right now is looking at going Sunday morning. I think you know in the morning sometime. Every Sunday. Year round. Every Sunday. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I also see that, I mean, again, I guess this is kind of the positive and the negative of including hours in the conditional use permit. Um, the hours that have been proposed has the business closed on Sunday. And I imagine the business wants to be closed on Sunday, but would there be any bad reason for us to basically make it the same hours every day of the week in the event that they decided someday they wanted to be open on Sunday? That's fine. Yeah. Okay. This, okay. is, this is this is going the right direction, just so you know. Okay. Yeah. We're trying no, to, I mean, thank we're you. To help, I we're agree. trying to give you flexibility. Um, I'm ready to make a motion if, I guess, the public hearing is still open. Yes. I don't know if anyone has anything else to say. I don't. Anyone else? Anyone from the... Anyone, anybody from the public? I move to close right there. <laughs> Nothing, you sure? You're here for support. <laughs> um, I move to close the public hearing. Second. Can I have a roll call? Thank you. Commissioner Harper Patterson? Yes. Commissioner Marsters? Yes. Commissioner Silverman? Yes. Vice Chair Bergman? Yes. And Chair Gutierrez? Yes. Uh, I move that the Planning Commission approve the request of Grace Lau Expedia Cruise Ship Centers for a conditional use permit to operate a formula business travel agency and approve the proposed wall sign at 864 Laurel Street, Suite Number 200, APN 050-163-270 based on the required findings and for the reasons incorporated in the staff report uh, with the addition of two conditions um, that the hours of operation be from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, seven days a week uh, with uh, an option for extended hours to 8 p.m. on one night per week uh, and that uh, the location may employ up to five workers at any in the facility at any given time. Is there a second? Second. Can I roll call vote? Commissioner Harper Patterson? Yes. Commissioner Marsters? Yes. Commissioner Silverman? Yes. Vice Chair Bergman? Yes. And Chair Gutierrez? Yes. Congratulations and thanks for your patience. All right, moving along. Reports on recent city council actions. No news for this evening. All right. Planning Commission comments or reports. So real quickly, is this the appropriate time to suggest that we, if, if this um, urgency ordinance passes, that the City Council look at timing of applications and cost of applications, as well as we think maybe that the design review process is a better way of undergoing some of addressing some of these changes? I think you've stated it for the record, but this is not the time for motions on our action. Motion yeah. is just a comment. That's your comment, and that's the appropriate yeah, thing to do. that's part of the record, too. So we're good. Correspondence, none? None for this evening other than what's already been provided on the dais. Planning staff comments, reports, and updates of current projects. None for this evening. That's great. Meeting adjourned. Above the description will allow you to view the request location on a detailed map. Inform San Carlos also allows users to receive updates to service requests in real time so that you can easily track the progress of a request made by yourself or even someone else. You can download Inform San Carlos now for free from the App Store on your Apple or Android phone or make a request at www.cityofsancarlos.com.